Sorry for getting very late, folks. Uh, we uh, were waiting for the camera crew to so all set. Um, this is the uh, a workshop for the Discovery Town Council. Um, today is Wednesday, April 5th. The conversation, um, before I turn it over to Tom for introductions, and uh, um, I put more there, is really about uh, public safety, dispatch, and communication. Um, and it's a very important topic that we've approached in the past, but more importantly now as we talk about a new public safety building and uh, the services that uh, might be included. That's a great introduction. This conversation has been kicking around this town in earnest since 2002. Uh, there's been all sorts of legislative issues that have impacted the conversation, uh, and then just local conversation as to whether or not um, supporting a local dispatch is a, an important priority for this town. And uh, through the years, uh, council has had council presence that confirm uh, that time and time again. Uh, what really brings the issue back to the council, and I'll be like that full responsibility for kind of uh, organizing. Uh, is the fact that we're undertaking a comprehensive look at what our future needs are for public safety. And so it's certainly an opportunity for us to have this conversation again as a check in. Uh, as I think about the likely design of the public safety fire uh, public safety complex, just that's likely to be kind of the brain, the central part of it. Uh, and so it's important to have 
some direction for the committee and for the responsibility to understand what, uh, what the future direction is. And so we're going to grab some of these kinds of attention tonight. We're going to see that check in. We're going to see that the chiefs have actually prepared a bit of an overview that uh, walks us through some of that history. And so uh, if it serves the purpose, I think that might be a good place to start. The dispatch is one of those services where it has to prove that there are other options. And this kind of thing that before. Um, there are pros and cons to it, as with most any other decision, and this policy decision that we know you folks will take very seriously. Um, so, part of what we've tried to do tonight is to not say we're not going to get into the weeds, but we're certainly willing to answer any questions you might have. We just want to look at some of the operational and economical impacts from you know, the surrounding dispatch we do things in history of way of how we got to where we are today. And uh, at the end of the day, just give you the direction from the folks that are behind us. So, some of the, the positives in this slide that we talked about is we, we were one of the first centers to, to consolidate the really fly and EMS dispatch back in 1972. Even the city of Portland back in that day had a special so we've got nearly 50 years of local experience. Um, when I, I walked into the dispatch center the other day just to chat with the guys that were on duty, and there were 106 years right now on the right side. We're good to that. And they were joking around because three of our veteran employees happened to be working that day. And between the three of those individuals, we've got 106 years of dispatch experience. Local knowledge is really a key um, aspect. Uh, and it's the, it's some of the recent things that come online. Scout has spent a lot of time in the urban address. And what can happen in um, some places that's really causing issues, now some of these centers are dealing with four, five, six main streets, other than avenues. Uh, and it has indeed caused direction of resources, of the responses, um, some of which that I even have to deal with um, So knowing the local area, um, knowing our clients, a lot of these folks that we deal with all the time, um, is certainly very critical and positive. One of the other things that um, we have always held dearly is that communication first impression that we make with the public that these that services, they handle the first call 95% of the time, um, and that first impression is critically important. The other thing is, is they are our safety network. Not only are they providing service to the public, but they are the ones that watch out back and they are on the streets and meet the systems. They're the ones that maintain awareness of where we are, what we're doing, and whether we need assistance. And sometimes we there are economies of scale, and there's a, a fine point where um, you're big enough to provide a lot of the service, but you're also small enough to make sure that you uh, really have a good fit for what's going on in the The other thing that uh, we feel in our and I know that she's going to talk about it, is having a presence in public safety services. We, they, most of them, have folks come into the station. Thank you. 
Operation Hope permits. There's, there's all kinds of things that go on every day. Those are some of the causes. Some of the challenges with consolidation, um, as we mentioned, the 24 7 presence in the lobby for those types of emergencies, the auto attendance versus the live operator. Um, one of the things that would happen, in especially the immediate uh, well, option for the consolidation, we would have to go through an extensive uh, conversion of our electronic record systems. We were on a certain uh, records management software program.
And once again, these consolidated factors aren't looking for that type of velocity. They just aren't capable of getting a bite of these in the asphalt. So there's going to be some lack of services and some other options needed to be explored. Demographics, uh, just a couple of slides here. The town is growing. As you folks know, we, we talk about growth all the time. They can go out and uh, show somebody how to, uh, you know, how to attach the, the uh, child seat in their car and so forth. They're trained for uh, crisis negotiation, so they actually, some of them respond, um, some of them are trained to respond with the SWAT team, uh, should it be called out, but also when they take that initial call, it's very important when they're able to, to sit right there, and again, as, as the chief said, when a supervisor can walk into that room and be able to be right there and, and monitor that conversation and know what's happening and so forth, that's, that's huge. Um, they're also certified uh, in the operation of the command van. So when we need to have the command van on scene, whether it be a, a police or a fire uh, situation, uh, that we need that piece of equipment, they're trained to be in there. So we've got our own person sitting right there dispatching from within that unit. Somebody that we know, somebody that knows us, they know how we work, they know what our operations are, they know what to expect, they know what to have ready for us. Um, it's just a huge piece that, I'm not going to tell you that it can't be done. There's, there's models all over the country where it can be done, and there's no question about that. And I don't think either one of us would argue that, but I, I think it's not the level of service that you get when you have your own, your own center. And um, I guess, you know, a couple of other things I would mention is that we're doing a lot of work with the schools, school safety. We've got Share 911 and dispatch is an integral part of that. We're doing tabletop exercises and so forth with the schools to make sure that we're able to react as quickly as we can if something goes wrong. And as the chief said, although nobody will tell you that, um, yeah, if you give them a call, they'll they'll look up on the monitor and tell you what happened or something. But um, to be able to, in our own center, see what's happening real time, so that our dispatchers can let our firefighters and EMS folks and, and police officers know what's going on in a situation like that is, to me, is absolutely critical. Um, so those are some of the some of the things that I feel strongly about in terms of having the, the presence here. Uh, and then we'll talk about the numbers. 
um, we look at the proposed uh, contract from the Cumberland County Regional Communication Center, and um, I, again, I don't think we would argue that they do a bad job. They they do a good job. It's not uh, this is not an indictment of what they do. Um, but their contract is $420,000, $420,894 in year one with 3% increases for the following two years. Um, the cost of a presence in our building, which I feel very strongly about, would range from a minimum of a day and evening receptionist at $165,040 uh, to what we would recommend if you were going to have somebody sitting there, we feel it should be a 24-hour presence, and if you were going to have somebody sitting there, our recommendation would be that you've got somebody at a little bit higher level than a receptionist that could do some other administrative work and so forth while they're sitting there doing something. But in order to just compare apples to apples for what uh, we would be doing, I think it's important if we we look at the contract at the $420,000 figure, and then if you add to that, even to match what we're doing now, to just have 24 hour even at a receptionist level, um, we're talking about another $275,067. So the total cost there is $695,961. If you take our current budget, and it looks higher than the $718,000 number that I'm pointing to here, and that's for a, a couple of different reasons. Number one, there are a lot of things built into our communications budget that we would still need to have in a budget, even if dispatch went away. For convenience, communications, our communications budget includes all of the phone service, all of the radio maintenance, all of those kinds of things that we would still have to deal with should this not, dispatch not be in place there. So if we look at, um, and, and our number is also driven a little bit higher than that because of the service that we're providing to Old Orchard Beach, but we're getting the revenues to offset that. So when we peel all that back and we look at what, it, what are we actually spending for dispatch service alone, it's 718639 uh, So it's a difference of $22,678 between what we would need from uh, the county's proposal with a presence in the building to what we're doing now. Beyond that, our IT department has taken a look at what annual uh, recurring costs we would have. And in order, to, uh, in order to operate, we would need to get fiber up to Wyndham and, and back. And uh, so that's another $13,200 in recurring costs. So when you, add focus, when you put that into the mix, the difference is really a little less than $9,500. So we also asked uh, the IT department to look at the startup cost. There are known costs of $107,500. Um, those are the things that are known. I, I expect that there would be some things that would go along as we went that we're not, uh, haven't taken a look at yet. The fire chief also mentioned the process with merging the, uh, the files from one system to another. And I can tell you that that is an arduous task. It's an expensive task. And it's not only expensive in terms of the money, but it's also expensive in terms of the efficiency because we have spent countless hours, so even since our last merger, um, going through because when those, melt, when those systems meld together, they do not always get everything correct. So there's a lot of time and energy that's gone into going back through those and looking at master names, for instance, which is uh, any time we have a contact with a person that if they don't already have a master name, it creates a master name. Well, when you start merging those, now you get duplicates and so forth, and it's, it takes a lot of time and energy to straighten that out. So I would say that it's not just the initial cost, but there are some ongoing costs, I think, if you want, if you want to get that right. Some, peop some departments do this, and they just live with whatever they've got. That hasn't been our... our um, we haven't operated like that, and I hope that we wouldn't. It's, it's worth noting, I think, um, through the years, one of the things, one of the options we've considered is municipal partnerships, mm -hmm. and uh, a number of our neighboring communities actually have good, strong partners in place. Frankly, to my knowledge, there really isn't a viable partner for us that's in close proximity. Right. So I, I just want to point out for council's benefit, the financial analysis and really the, the, the most viable option in front of us would be to go to Cumberland County. Uh, that's not always been the case through the years, but through 
decisions they've made, they either don't want us or can't take us, or we're not a good match for them. So there's really not a good municipal partnership that we could consider. Can we ask questions as we go? No, absolutely. Yeah. So in this cost analysis that you did, there's a couple sure. of things. One is um, if you can uh, recap the uh, interlocal agreement that we have on um, shared services or provide services for Old Orchard, it would seem to me that um, um, the impact of that would be negligible in the sense that the margin over what their actual, the actual cost is, we're not making a ton of money because um, we're incurring the cost and then there's a small margin over that, right? Right. So it's not, it's less than 100000 I think. Right. Right. Yeah. So um, the cost that, did you take a look at this, what would the cost impact be to the facility? So while, you know, it's $22,000 is what you're saving, which to me really isn't um, um, worth it, but to the footprint of the new facility, mm -hmm. how, would it re uh, how would it reduce the shape of that facility? Because that is a cost that we wouldn't incur as a result of making an alternative choice. Mm -hmm. have, have you done that part of it? Um, we have not factored the actual cost. I can tell you that uh, right now in the schematic of the building, I think there's a 36 by 36 uh, foot area that's the dispatch uh, piece. And then there's a bathroom, a small kitchenette, a couple of storage room, I believe, coat closet. Yeah, so we've looked at it and we've seen the area, the dispatch area that they're proposing, and it's not substantial in any. I don't see it making any overall major difference. Yeah. Do you know what the, on the project? Do you know what the square foot cost is? Yeah, it, it's it's yeah. I just did it quickly. Yeah. It's 36 by 36. They're now using 300 square foot. So that's about 300. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I rounded 88,000. Yeah. So, but on a cost basis, what is that? Is that a million dollars reduction no, in the project, or is that going to be 36? If, if it's 36 feet by 36 feet right. times 300. Oh, 300. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. It's 300. It's 389,000. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And then you've got ongoing heating and right. yeah. lighting and all that. Uh, 20% you know, Right. So uh, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, are there any special requirement, construction requirements for dispatch? Does it have to be you know, radio shielded? Does it have to be bomb proof, bullet proof, hardened site kind of thing? Or is it can be just regular construction? Pretty much regular construction. Mm -hmm. There are some things. We would want to have a raised floor so that you can uh, run cabling and so forth underneath the floor mm -hmm. so that things can get moved around or so that you can access wiring and so forth when you need. Um, uh, certainly a bulletproof front in the reception, but we would be looking to do that whether the dispatch was there or not. Um, I don't know that there's any other real big considerations. Okay. Um, so uh, you, you guys give a real long list and a very inclusive list of the services that, that we get as a community from dispatching. Mm -hmm. Do we give those similar services to Old Orchard? To the extent we can. Yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, any time you look at this, I, I, again, I would say that you're never as good as you are in your own home. Yeah. So um, Old Orchard's very happy with our services. I think we provide them a good service. I'd be the first to tell you I don't think it's the same service that they would get if they had their own in-house dispatch. And if I might add, part of that is because they have chosen not to make certain investments to do that. It's right. not that we're not capable or wouldn't provide. Right. Right. They have made a conscious. Yeah, I was thinking in terms of the hard, hard facilities. I was thinking in terms of you know, knowledge of local knowledge, street knowledge, history there. Of you know, so you develop that over time. Um, I would imagine, but. Uh, you know, I, we're, we're fortunate with them too because they are a neighboring community. We do a lot with them, so mm -hmm. folks know each other and you know, communicate. And the last question I have: Do we have any um, any indication of the, the Cumberland County costs over time? I mean, you, you gave us a quote for the contract that they gave us, but I mean, what's to say in three years they don't just arbitrarily decide? You know, we really need six hundred thousand. Um, we look at our county taxes; there doesn't seem to be you know, any real predictability in the increase. And if we forego these facilities, okay. there's no guarantee that they were going to have a predictable cost through Cumberland County. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. I think it's true. And they proposed a uh, three-year pro uh, initial proposal that has a 3% right. escalator every year. Right. From a governor's point of view, as I understand, the communication center has its own board of sorts. Um, I think they still do answer to the Cumberland County commissioners, of course. 
Um, so there's there's some layers of governance there. Um, I suspect those rate discussions happen at multiple levels. But you're right, so that's a concern going forward. As chair of the finance committee for uh, Cumberland County budget, you're absolutely correct. It's completely unpredictable, and that's, that's another whole conversation regarding state revenue. And if we don't go with this facility, though, we're locked into right. that. That's the only other option well, we I have long term. Yeah, I think right. that Chief, you know, Chief Thurlow's comment is right. If we, if we make it, if we make a change. And even if, actually, even if we keep it the same, we should be all in because there's no way of coming back. So if we decide to go to CCRC, uh, we are not coming back, and so we are going to be mm -hmm. subject to whatever happens at the county level. So, yeah. did you still want to go? No, no, I'm not. Um, so I, this is probably, I think, the third time that I've sat through this, um, and I, my position obviously hasn't changed in the slightest. If anything it's probably more hardened um, I can't imagine taking dispatch of Scarborough um, personally I think it's irresponsible it would be irresponsible to our citizens to do that um, our dispatchers know our firefighters and they know our officers inside and out and that is a partnership that few people understand unless I think you're in the business um, I don't see any benefit going to Cumberland County. I think it's a ho opening a whole slew of problems. Um, not to mention you're putting then, you, we know Cumberland County is not going to take all our dispatchers, so we've got people that will be unemployed. Um, like you said, there's a, over 106 years of knowledge in that dispatch center, which is just amazing. Um, I, when I knew this was going to be on here, Peter and I both are serving on the new building committee, um, which is really an honor to do. Um, but when I knew this was going to be on the, our agenda, last weekend with my son, we downloaded the, you can download the app and you can listen to the dispatch. Because um, I wanted to refresh myself with it, but it's kind of been a while for me. Um, and. I, every time I do that, I'm always amazed at the level of professionalism. Uh, you know, I mean, some of these, sometimes these are high pressure, intense situations. Their voices are calm, professional, um, courteous, knowledgeable. Every single call, every single time that radio came on, I never once heard anything that I wouldn't be proud to say. I'm so lucky to be a town councilor for that for those people because I was so proud of them. And I think that's something that you don't get necessarily when you transfer over services because you, you lose something in that. You lose something. And I think if this were, when we talked about this with residents the last time this came before the council, the majority of residents, I don't think I talked to any that said they wanted this to happen at whatever cost savings it was going to happen because they didn't want to lose that level of familiarity. And for me, that's a big, that's, that's huge. Um, and I also think it's a big thing for our officers. You know, I mean, they're, I, you got to know they're in and out of dispatch all the time. Um, and that, to me, is an important connection, and I would hate to see that, to lose that. Um, I've been on the receiving end of having to drive up there and need medical services, and I've seen what Operation Hope has done. Um, and to lose those things would just, I think, would be a huge loss to this town. Not to mention the things that you're doing in the schools. So uh, the the list of pros so farly outweighs the list of cons for me that it's like it's it's a no-brainer for me. So I guess I didn't have any questions. So no. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. If, if you want to finish, uh, and sure. Wrap up. I think you have a summary page. Sure. Well, I think somebody mentioned that. Uh, that there would be a, uh, you know, consideration for unknown cost of unemployment or severance packages or something if we had to do something like that. Um, and the summary is that, you know, there is no question that dispatch services could be consolidated. Um, I think it comes down to what the citizens want for a level of service. Um, are, the, are the net projected savings worth the reduction in services to the citizens, the first responders, and, and the other departments? Um, if we use that projected annual difference of $9,478, the mill rate change would be 0.02 cents. 
uh, and on a three hundred thousand dollar home, the impact would be fifty seven cents annually or five cents monthly or one penny weekly and then we took a quick look at um, you know what this looked like in terms of other services that the citizens have wanted to have um, so the first one is the net uh, savings to eliminate dispatch. Then you look at uh, curbside recycling, um, route one sidewalk plowing, beach cleaning, and the uh, beach parking enforcement and how they compare. And this is certainly not an indictment of any of those services. I think it's just an indication that our citizens do like to have services. And that's the end. Any other questions? <laughs> For council, or uh, for staff, or can I just ask you a clarifying of question? The the nine hundred, the nine thousand dollars, yes, um, savings. That that did not include the IT ongoing costs. Was was my understanding when you were going through it? That was no, I'm sorry, it did. Oh, it, that it did. did. Okay. Yeah, there was twenty two thousand dollars worth of savings. Um, gotcha. That was that was with. And then the, the thirteen thousand two right. recurring brought it down to the ninety. But that was with that was with the lowest <laughs> level of receptionist twenty four seven. That That's was correct. not with the That's you know, managerial. Okay. Sorry, I'm taking notes. Go ahead. Just a quick question. I know I know that's as clear I talked about in the past, but in this as for preparation for this, have you talked any? people that are currently with Cumberland County Dispatch recently and what their experiences are and you know the things that we heard in the past still resonating the things that you just summarized to reflect that from my own perspective counselor um, a lot of the fire chiefs that I speak with uh, are happy with the services that are being provided up there I think Bill and his team do a fine job for a lot of my peers None of them ever had any control of dispatch. They were always at the mercy of their police department. Um, and very few of them, if any, have the relationship that we've established over the years and, and our predecessors before us. It's not just the two of us. So to be honest with you, dispatch for most of the fire chiefs in, in my realm has always been a necessary evil. And they haven't had a lot of control, and they've been happy to see it go to county because um, it's easier for them to be a member of that board and have some control and some say in how policies are developed and how things go than it was prior to that. So it's a little slanted, but that uh, I can tell you that a lot of them are happy. But the, the thing to, to put it in context is a lot of those departments are significantly smaller than we are. And there is a very fine line between um, large enough to, to do the job well and have the resources to do it well and the other side of that coin. Um, that's part of why we brought Old Orchard on. It got us to the point where we were able to get some additional manpower, have a little bit more supervision. It, it made that right fit. We're not looking, and I know Chief uses the, <laughs> the phrase, we're not looking to be the Walmart of dispatch, and we're not. We wanted to get to a size that made good sense for us. And I think some of those other communities have found that niche uh, with the county. And I will say on the police side that although departments are not unhappy with the service that they get, I think they're satisfied, but they also recognize it's not the service that they would get from their own in-house dispatch. And, and I have many tell me, um, you know, if they, they would never give it up if they could help it. Uh, and just, you know, one other thing I would just say, just from my own perspective, you know, I called chiefs in other departments or officers in other departments for different reasons. and. Um, it's aggravating. It's aggravating to, to call someplace and get, um, and, and again, it's not because of the county, but it's just the way it's set up. You call, they have no idea if anybody's in that building or not, so you call, you get a kind of a run around through there, then you get shipped to the building, and you get in a, in a loop, and generally by the time you get the person that you want, you, you're a little uh, aggravated anyway. And, and when I'm calling, it's not because I even have a problem. I'm just calling for business. If I had a, if I was already upset about something, by the time I got through that process, I'd probably be even more so. So the the construction costs that we mentioned, I assume that's just just general construction costs. Have we taken into account um, communication equipment, upgrading those infrastructures? I would assume that 
we would want to take this opportunity with new investments to make sure that we're current beyond, <laughs> uh, not just up to where we are now. I would hope that we would be a little proactive and go a little bit beyond there. So are there, are there a significant additional costs associated with upgrading that equipment to new standards or new levels? Uh, that, that number is being tossed out as a very rudimentary mm -hmm. shoot from the sure. hip yep. Yep. estimate. Yep. And the way the consultant explained it to us, well, part of this process is a very detailed cost estimating process with professionals that look at actual costs. The number that Councillor Hayes mentioned is the way they explained it to us. It's a gross number that gets you in that ballpark. For instance, the space where the apparatus packs is a hollow big cement block. It's a lot cheaper to build that space sure. than it is the dispatch center. So sure. yes, there will be some additional costs in the dispatch 36 by 36 room, but we make up for that in the library. So that's, yeah, that's just the average it's cost. A, it's an average with cost. everything included. We will have a fully sure. functional dispatch center in that facility. I think it's fair to say too, I mean, Old Orchard went to York County first before moving to Scarborough, correct? Sanford. Sanford, okay. So. I mean, it says, uh, to me, it says a little bit about the caliber of our dispatch center when we have another town switching towns because they're not happy. And how long has Little Orchard been with Scarborough? At least a couple years, right? Yeah, I think it's our third. I think yeah. finishing up our third, I think. Yeah. I think it's on our third. And the people that you talk to down there are far happier now than they were when they more first made that move. And that was not a move that they wanted to make in the first place. I mean, the police department did not want to give up their their dispatch center, but unfortunately, it was taken out of their hands. Uh, <coughs> I looked at your uh, financial analysis, <coughs> and I think it's a fair apples to apples comparison. <coughs> They're taking the, the cost of a 24-hour receptionist and adding it to the county amount, and I don't think we'd ever have less that a 24-hour reception and it comes out to be a wash right so then you say well what's the level of service comparison because that's what you're at if it's about the same cost and I mean it looks like it would be a severe degradation in the level of service if we were to go to the county so the experience the presence all of the types of things that allow people in the community to access dispatch, not just uh, by phone, but by their physical presence, it strikes me that it's, uh, it's a very clear case in favor of keeping dispatch. Well, I, I, mean, I, I guess the only thing I would say was the only thing I could, I could see in, in that analysis would be the build out of the, and the equipment and, and the new building, but I, you know, their startup costs that would be associated with doing the transfer also. So. But from an ongoing basis, I completely agree that there's, this doesn't make financial sense. It's not worth the, the effort. But I appreciate the analysis. This has been terrific. I now feel very well informed to say that I agree that it doesn't seem to make sense. So I guess for me, from a budget standpoint, we're trying to be predictable, sustainable, and, and reasonable over time. And I think if we, we may you know, receive even a small amount of short-term savings over a couple of years, but I think um, once we lose that predictability and that control, um, we find ourselves in a similar situation that we do on the school side of things where we have to just react with very little recourse. So I think, um, you know, whether the, you know, I, I appreciate the numbers, whether others don't um, is irrelevant to me. I'm looking at the long-term predictability of controlling our own costs, controlling our own budgets. Uh, I think this is a way for us to be a little bit more sustainable and predictable. So I can't see the, the benefits of moving this offsite. Uh, maybe there's a short term one, but long term I think we end up uh, you know stepping over a dollar to pick up a dime. So Council Foley? Yeah, I would concur with my fellow council for the most part. I I mean I would have to see significant financial savings, uh, you know, such that would plug a big gap that we might find elsewhere <laughs> uh, in order for it to make sense and make zero sense at this point and particularly what Council Kiaza said about our ability to predict and control. I think wherever, there's so many places where we can't do that, that we should be mindful and careful of, uh, of the ones that we can. So. I did, actually I did have a question. Well, I don't know if it's 100% related to this or not, but it is. Do you have, have you, have you taken a, a 
snapshot back in time and looked at how our population growth affects dispatch services in terms of you know number of calls, percentages. Like let's say, so if we have a 10% population growth over the next three years. What is that going to do to your both departments? It, it's really, it's not quite that simple because it really depends on what the growth is. Yeah. You know, when you have a, a big box store come in, for instance, that changes the, the game completely. Yeah. So um, we do look at that. We do look at trends and so forth, and we do uh, look at projections. But um, it's, it's uh, a little bit more difficult than just saying, Population. The uh, the county proposal is per capita based, so it's a cost per capita. So, to the extent that growth is shown in more people, you would see a direct um, reciprocal effect uh, in additional cost from that contract. That's the way it's structured. There's a fair amount of absorption that we can have. You know, we don't have to add an extra dispatcher because of you know 100 lot subdivision, for instance. But there's a, there is a point where that tips, and you do need more staff. That's one of the benefits of the Old Orchard contract. The additional services or dispatchers we brought in to service those needs are also taking our calls. Right. And so they've actually avoided some costs that we would probably be facing and bearing ourselves. Okay. Uh, so there's some value there. So um, since everyone's spoken, so for you and staff, uh, what do you need from the council to uh, continue this conversation or to uh, have a, you know, some direction from us? What, do you, what would you like? I really wanted to give guidance to the, to the building committee. Uh, they are fully engaged in the needs analysis, so now is the opportunity to provide that feedback. And I simply did not want to get months or years down the road and someone said, yeah. why didn't we talk about yeah. this? Uh, so that's why we're here. Is the construction cost going to be broken out of just the dispatch center? Is that part of the, the consultant's um, charge what? to actually break that out? So the, you know, because that would be the only thing if it's we're talking with, you know. It, I'm under the impression, I mean, any, any other project that I've worked on like this, it's always broken down by area. So. Yeah. I mean, they have the square footage. Yeah. But I guess where I am is I, I concur with everybody else. And it, it wouldn't make any sense to make a change for all the reasons articulated. I would just like to get a better handle on, because we are talking about a new building. Right. Mm -hmm. And because already the building you know, we had a number in mind. This building is coming in, as it looks right now, over that number. And as you can see, we're going to have some tough choices to make as a community around lots of things going forward. So we'd like to get a little better handle on what is that construction cost build out. If it's, if it's on the low end, it doesn't make that much difference. But if it's a big number, right. that, I think that's why Tom brought it forward. But that That is something we have some control over. So for what it's worth, I, I'm also curious about a better the 300 is a ballpark number. You know, that's what the consultant is using. But it would be useful, I think, to get just a, if they have a better number that we could say, okay, this is what all in would be. And it may or may not change what we just talked about. Maybe a question more for, for Tom. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not suggesting we try and compete with Cumberland County by any stretch of the imagination, but are there potentially other communities out there that have either inquired in the past or may again look at coming to us to augment their dispatching services? Certainly. We've had on uh, and off relations with Buxton. Yeah. Um, all this might be an opportunity. Don't we Geography answer does matter. Be so yeah. yeah, don't we answer 911 for Buxton. So I think there are opportunities there. And I, but I know the Chiefs would be very careful about who they take on. Sure. We don't want to, to compromise our current service levels for our residents or, or Old Orchard for that matter. Uh, but, but we always look for that opportunity. And again, Chris, that's a great question because if that was something we wanted to, I think part of this is to look ahead at where we're going. If that is something we wanted to pursue, and we made the decision that we're going to keep it, then that begs the question, do we build more space into the dispatch center so we have that flexibility going forward? That's why this conversation, so, so it's a great question. I don't know the answer to it. Do we, do we know the current square footage of the dispatch in the curve? Um, but as big as the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> it's not big. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they put a lot of equipment in there. 36, I think. 
Thirty feet. Thirty feet. I honestly don't know. Thirty feet. It kind of goes down, down and then. Six, but it's not <laughs> like, as wide. It's not yeah. less than. The space one. that we budgeted for the new one is not significantly wider no. than this one. But if we have built in six stations, planning for the potential of um, the growth of a Buxton or Cape, we're not looking to to get much bigger than that. That is the sweet. I don't. Yeah, and I don't. I I understand where you guys are coming from where you're concerned about you know the build out of the building and if if that's going to be worth keeping dispatched i think i i don't i don't even think that's going to come even to i i don't it's i'm trying to think of the right way to to phrase this but being I, there is in my opinion absolutely no reason there's no money value that could get me to, to get rid of dispatch. And that's how strongly I feel our connection with this group of people is. And I, uh, uh, you, guys, you, you guys are always coming in as the money guys, and that's what makes this council so great. And I know I'm always the emotional one. But uh, for me, it's just they work extremely well. To, I mean, it's an incredible group of people. They know this community inside and out. Um, I don't want somebody in Cumberland County directing EMS to my house if someone's having a heart attack and they don't know, have any idea where my house is. You know what I mean? So there's just something about the familiarity and the dispatchers knowing the community that they work in. So to uh, summarize, um, it seems that there is a general consensus that we would like to continue including dispatch services as part of the <coughs> public safety building. However, we would like to see some details regarding um, some final numbers or some uh, more accurate numbers regarding the cost of that in the detail. Um, but there seems to be some general consensus that we want to continue with what we currently provide. Good. Unless anyone else disagrees, um, we only have about five minutes, so um, we can close the workshop. Peter and I can get a report back to you yeah. guys. I guess that, that was going to be my question is where, where, where are we in the process and what's the next report out date for us to receive? Well, I mean, it, we could get we, we could get you a final a, a, a snapshot plan of what they have proposed so far, but I would think it would be a couple of months before we could even ballpark the yeah. need of what would go inside of it. So how about if, uh, at, uh, not obviously tonight, but at the next council meeting, the manager could come back and report on <coughs> that information um, after talking with our two delegates to the committee and then also the chiefs and the rest of the committee. Yeah, we have four members that sit on that committee, so they're intricately involved in those details. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm just asking for the update. I'm not, I'm not pressuring for a certain... Oh, no, no. No, I, I know, I know. Okay. Yeah. Does the committee have minutes? Yeah, we have yeah. posted on the we have a committee website on the town's website okay. that has all the approved minutes and the agendas. I'll send you the link. On the documents. Good. Yeah, I'd like to be able to keep current by just sure. reading the minutes yeah. for yeah. each meeting. Great. Well, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for the positive feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation.
So I'm without a gavel tonight, so I'm hoping that some of the uh, great vibes from the Scarborough Kindness Project falls through into the chambers tonight, because I'm going to be running the meeting without the gavel. So uh, if we can be uh, mindful of our decorum and our rules, that would be wonderful. Um, with that, if we could have uh, roll call, please. Councillor Foley? Here. Councillor Hayes? Here. Councillor Rowan? Here. Councillor Chiazzo? Here. Councillor St. Clair? Here. Councillor Donovan? Here. Councillor Tier Baybon? Here. And uh, moving into item number four, general public comments. This is an opportunity for you to uh, speak uh, to the council and to the citizens of Scarborough. Um, our rules are pretty general in the sense that you do have three minutes and it's on any item that is not currently on the agenda. You can state your name and address as well, as far as the town that you live in. Uh, the time shouldn't start till I start speaking. And I'd like to remind uh, Chairman uh, Babine, uh, previously you thought the flag should be on this side. I was watching the congressional hearings for uh, Judge Gorsuch, and the flag was on the other side of the room. Maybe you know more about where the flag should be than the Congress of the United States, but I would think that would be highly unlikely. I'm here tonight to talk about uh, several items. Uh, I'm getting uh, calls about the fire department, and apparently a person was hired at the fire department from another department, and the first day on the job he was made captain, and he was supposed to be doing inspections out in the town of Scarborough for the safety of the uh, residents. And according to my sources, he takes a week off every month, and currently he's doing a uh, tour with Russian exchange people for this week. He's not at the uh, fire station. And the sources also report that he was fired from the J Fire Department for misuse of a department credit card. And I'm wondering uh, what the situation is going to be uh, developing forward with this uh, member of the fire department. The other item is that uh, I've got reports, uh, numerous reports, that police officers sent down side roads off of Route 1 looking for uh, streetlights that are out, and that's considered a call for service, or for potholes on the road, and that's called as a call for service. And one of the officers uh, reported that Another officer was sent on phony police calls and followed to them by a sergeant to see if he would go to the phony police calls. And that officer was uh, Michael Mayetta. That's one of the reasons why he left the department. And the uh, fireman that uh, I've been getting reports on is James Butler. <coughs> and I'm going to be asking for questions on freedom of access about James Butler. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Jackie Perry. I live at 215 Black Point Road, and I'm just going to take a second to tell you how pleased I had been to work with Mr. Bacon. I had worked with him on several projects. I sent a letter to him, and I am going to be so sad to see him leave. He was an asset, a huge asset, when we were doing the Wentworth building and, and other projects for the school department. And I hope his replacement will be half as good. Thank you very much. Anybody else that would like to get up and speak? Anybody else? If I can uh, remind you if you can um, state your name and address for us, please. Benjamin Howard, Seven Windsor Pines. Um, tonight, I'm sorry that I look like this. I've been very busy, and I have reached out to the counselors once to try to get coffee with you on on uh, the topic of communication to the general public. Um, after coming to these meetings every night for a couple months now, it's amazing tonight to see that there's such a huge crowd out here. Um, why is it this one topic, the budget, that is the thing that brings the people out? out of their houses to come sit for maybe an hour, two hours a night to put their input and their voice into the town. Um, I will admit I'm not very good with social media or any of the things. I know it's a surprise. I'm a millennial. I mostly just use it to, you know, keep tabs on other people. Um, <laughs> and 
surprise. Uh, that's what all the big companies are doing, so why not me? But um, to continue on anyways, um, I, I know that's one of the things that the town looks to try to do is to bolster their social media account to reach the general public. Um, in general, it's a great idea in theory, but Facebook's algorithm eventually just pushes you out of the news feed even if I choose to like the news page because I don't like all the stories and I don't read the articles. Eventually it just says, well, I can't get him to stay on Facebook long enough to show him X amount of advertisements, keep sh keeping showing him this advertisement as opposed to just showing him a video of someone making food in less than a minute and going, mm, yes, this is very good. Um, to that point and to the public out here tonight, I, I believe that the most important part of the United States government lies in the town and that is why I started coming after the recent election as I felt that you can do more good for your daily life by coming to these town debates and arguing. And I, I, I think at some points that I've reached out to some counselors and maybe swayed um, to get my opinions across and to budget things or other things. Tonight we're discussing the budget and last week there was a, or last meeting there was a huge um, amount of money that is coming into the budget due to a project that's coming into town where people could have come out and um, discussed these things. So to my quick thoughts about as to how you keep attendance up like this is we try to keep having more interesting topics or try to um, engage the public and explain to them how these things will affect their lives daily instead of just people coming out this one time because now all the money is divvied up throughout the year. This is the best time for me to come out. So I hope that um, tonight um, more of you will start coming to these meetings and, and start voicing your opinion because it's not just tonight that you can have your voice heard. It's every single one of these nights. You can come up and use three minutes to just talk about whatever you want to get heard. So thank you. Uh, good luck tonight. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak? Anybody else? Yeah. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'm actually going to ask someone to come up and speak. I'd like to invite uh, Dan Bacon up to the podium to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bacon. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this is your one chance to leave early. <laughs> now that you're leaving. <clears throat> Either you can speak first or we can. It's your choice. Uh, you called me up, so okay. why don't you <laughs> Dan, you've been a tremendous uh, part of my senior management team and, and really a right hand in so many respects. So I'm, I'm really going to miss you. Um, you spent a lot of time in this council chamber. And I, I know many on uh, this side of the table uh, want to wish you well, and I suspect they can say it better than I can. So um, just on behalf of myself and staff, uh, I've really enjoyed it, and I'm sure our paths will cross again. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any council would like to comment? Yes. Council Donovan? Uh, your skill and your ability to communicate with people has just been extraordinary the last uh, nearly four years <coughs> that we've been working together on numerous projects. Uh, I so appreciated your guidance and uh, professionalism, and uh, we're really going to miss you. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Dr. St. Clair? I remember the first meeting I had with you, and I was a completely brand new counselor, and I remember sitting across from you, and walking out of your office thinking, I have no idea what he just said to me. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a single clue. I am so a good communicator. And I was like, what am I doing here? Oh, my God. Um, and you have shown so much patience over the last six years and so much. Um, I, never once did you make me feel bad for asking repeated questions or um, questions that probably weren't always the brightest. Um, that I probably should have known by that point, but um, you, I, never once have I ever seen you make anyone feel bad for anything they've ever done, and that is not something you can say about everybody. Uh, it's a huge loss for us. It was, I was devastated when Tom told me. Um, I, I wish you so much. Uh, the, I think we care for you so much that we're so happy that you're getting this opportunity, and it's great for you and your wife and your family, um, but it's a huge loss for us. Uh, so I hope 
that we get to see you in the future. I hope that we get to work together again, and I just wish you all the best. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Mr. Rowan? Yeah, I think there have been uh, a number of times over the past several weeks where it's really just been, um, uh, it's just struck me how much we're going to miss you, Dan. Um, and I wanted to say thank you. Um, our town is much better off for you having worked here for 12, 13 years. Yeah, right there. Right there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank, and you and <laughs> thank you and good luck. Thank you. Um, so I haven't had the pleasure of working with you in a formal capacity uh, for very long, but um, what I will say and what I've observed over time is actually a little opposite of what Kate said. For me, what you've done, your, the greatest skill and the thing I appreciate the most is then you take really complex pieces and make it simple and understandable, and that's a huge skill. Uh, and I've greatly appreciated it when it had something to do with a question that I needed answered for whether it had to do with Lucky Lane or somewhere else in town. So um, it's definitely a huge loss for the town and wish you the very best. And we're glad to know that you're going to be local. Thanks. Still. Thanks, Katie. Also, Hayes. Yeah, I think I'll ditto to what everybody said. And then, and then for me, I, I also really want to thank you for your professionalism I mean, it, and your sense of, of humor because I really think that that really has made the conversations very easy. and. W w with a point of pride of leaving the community, I think if you look back at, at where we were before you arrived and all the things that you really have put in place and have accomplished has really moved the town forward. So w with all of that, we wish you the best. Good luck on your camping trip. Uh, I'd be curious yeah. to hear, <laughs> hear your stories when you get back. <clears throat> and thank you for all that you've done for the town of Scarborough. Thanks, and Gary. good luck. Thank you. Yeah, so... Um, yeah. I, I rarely am I at a loss for words. I've been thinking about this for a while. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I can't really express my appreciation of coming on fresh um, with a certain point of view uh, and sitting down in a matter of about 10 minutes with a conversation with you going, yeah, that's not really how this works. <laughs> so I, I appreciate your guidance and your, and your, uh, your, your, your patience for sure. Um, we're going to miss a, a lot of that confidence and, and a lot of that... Um, um, trust, I think, and I'm not saying that when we get somebody in, that's going to take them a while to get there, uh, but certainly I, I felt a lot more comfortable when you were up there behind the podium guiding us through the process, and uh, that's going to that's going to sorely be missed. So I'm I'm glad you're staying local, and I'm 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 pretty confident our paths will cross again in in the future. But best of luck, fair winds, and following seas for sure. Uh, thank you, thanks, Chris. So as the last <coughs> one to speak, but it's always hard because everyone else has said uh, everything. I actually remember. Um, when Joseph Newski hired you, and uh, we were about half the size we are today, uh, definitely did not have the growth that we currently have. And I was, I was like, wow, you know, um, is he going to be able to really take over and, and take this forward? And um, I just want to suggest that um, um, the measure of a good leader isn't just about the great work that they've done, which you've done. It's also about the respect that you gain from that work. And I hope that you know that uh, from a council perspective, but I think from a town as, as a whole, you've been a big part of how this community looks and feels and um, has grown and I just really want to say thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, if you I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> know what to say, I mean I, I, I mean, I really appreciate all the kind words um, and I mean I want to thank all of you. I've, I mean it takes kind of two for you guys to trust me and I think it's um, I really appreciate the relationships I have with all of you. You know, that I think the time I've spent up here has helped kind of form those relationships, but also at committee meetings and, and um, outside of this uh, chambers. And, you know, I really appreciate the trust you have in me, but also in our staff. And it's not just me, but I'm backed up by a lot of other key players that enable me to be here um, and not have to worry about a variety of other things. So, um, you know, I have a lot to do with it, but I've also, my staff has a lot to do with it, and also the town manager um, and Tom's trust and support to once take these kind of uh, planning and growth management risks or sort of innovative ideas and, and run with them. And I think Scarborough has been really successful um, with that relationship and with that trust and with that dialogue. And I think to a person, we've all kind of brainstormed together to kind to find solutions and to come up with a uh, the right next step. So um, we've accomplished a lot, but and I've been part of it. But I think certainly the council and all the committees that support you are a really big part of it too. Um, I think particularly the long-range planning committee is sort of the the think tank for a lot of 
the important initiatives that uh, I work on and then bring to you when they're when they're ready for your review and action. So, so much work goes on um, at that level that gets things ready for, for prime time. So, um, I don't know, I th I thank you. And, you know, Scarborough is a special dynamic place. Um, it's also a community that even before my time here had a really strong commitment to planning. I, I think of your sister, Katie, and, and that sort of generation of leaders at the time. There was a lot of planning work and a lot of thought that went into things and, and Sean in your first round uh, on the council a lot of the framework was in place for me to kind of take it to the next level so um, I think it's that town commitment to planning that enabled me to try some new things and and work with you on on creative solutions so I appreciate it and thanks for thanks for all the kind words thanks for doing it in front of the biggest audience <laughs> <laughs> I think I need a tissue. I'm going to start crying. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Anybody else that would like to speak on any item not on the agenda? Um, closing the general public comments. Yeah. Item number five, minutes for March 15, 2017. If I could have a motion. Move approval. Second. Any edits, uh, corrections, or modifications to note? Not seeing any. All in favor? Is that all in favor? Oh, <laughs> That's <unanimous>. Thank you. <laughs> and um, uh, items to be signed, the treasurer's warrants, I'll sign those as we go through the meeting. Order number 17-028, a 7 o'clock public hearing, and action on the re new requests for a food handler's license, a liquor license, an innkeeper's license, and a special amusement license from, and I apologize if I mispronounce this, Migus, or Migus, Hotel Group, Higgins Beach, LLC, DBA, Higgins Beach Inn, located at 34 Ocean Avenue. Uh, before we get into any, anybody that would like to speak on this item, come to the podium. Not seeing it, we'll close the pump. Oh, you like yeah. this? Uh, my name is uh, Phil Cronenthal, um, owner of Higgins Beach Inn, and I just want to thank the council for hearing us. Uh, are hearing our request today. Uh, we are very happy to uh, become part of the Higgins Beach community and uh, carry on a great tradition in that building. Uh, it's, it's an institution um, and uh, we've gone through um, great expense and great care to refresh it and revitalize it and set it up for success for another hundred years and uh, we're really looking forward to being a part of that uh, and a part of that uh, in this community for a long time. Thank, Thank you. you. And I apologize uh, a little bit without the gavel, I get confused, right? Um, I, this is the formal opening of the public hearing, so if anybody would like to speak during the public hearing, you can get up and speak. <coughs> Not seeing any, the public hearing is closed. Um, if I could have a motion. So moved. So moved. Second. Uh, council comments. Councilor Donovan. Uh, this new owner comes with uh, a terrific reputation. Uh, and uh, uh, all sorts of changes and improvements are being made. I go by it each day as I come and go from my home, and uh, everyone in our community at Higgins Beach is looking forward to uh, this uh, new new era of the Higgins Beach Inn. Thank you. Council Foley. Um, I would just say that, you know, Higgins Beach and the Higgins Beach Inn is it's part of why I moved to Maine. It's where I fell in love with the state of Maine. Um, I actually did my final thesis project for my MBA recently on the Higgins Beach Inn. And so I'm really excited to see uh, what changes you guys have come up with and, and how it goes forward. But I'm most happy just to see that it's going forward and that someone is going to care for it as much as it's been cared for in the past. So really excited and welcome to Scarborough. Councilor Chiazza. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Cronenthal for coming before the council. Um, he's the first kind of owner, I think, in, in my tenure that's actually come before us. and. And, uh, and asked us directly, but now that he's here, I will ask for samples the next time that you come through. <laughs> so that's kind of my recurring theme. So just, just you know, something to think about for the next renewal process. <laughs> well, welcome to Scarborough. I, I wish you the best. Cool, like any other council comments? <laughs> Not seeing any council comments. All in favor? 
and that is unanimous. Thank you. Order number 17-029, a 7 o'clock public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license and a liquor license for Susan Clough, doing business as the Garage Barbecue, or BBQ, located at 3 East Grand Avenue. Um, and I will open up the public hearing if anybody would like to get up and speak. Hi. <coughs> Excuse me, I am Susan Clough from 78 King Street in Scarborough. Um, I also want to thank Dan Bacon uh, from the private sector, in Pine Point at least. You've been a very balancing influence. Um, I've been through uh, a lot of things, including a comprehensive plan with Dan, and we've always been happy with his work. We're just happy we'll be able to work with you in the private sector now, so that's a good thing. Um, we are now 3 East Grand LLC, but my husband and I are currently Bailey's Lobster Pound um, in the Bait Shed Restaurant, so I think that or I hope that everybody realizes we have a good reputation for running a business that is very um, well received. We don't have any problems with uh, you know, our liquor license that we currently have. Um, we're currently renovating Conroy's Garage in Pine Point, which is going to be the garage barbecue as well as some gift shops. We, have, um, we are limiting ourselves to 9 o'clock at night to respect our neighbors, so no food or liquor will be served after 9 o'clock at night. Um, and so I think that uh, we'll run something that the neighborhood is really excited about and waiting for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else that would like to speak? Me. Anybody else before Chris tells us what he's expecting? Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing. And if I could have a motion. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, Council comments. Councilor St. Clair. Um, I just think it's uh, this two in a row tonight. Hmm? I don't, uh, something, must be something in the air. Thank you for coming. Um, we don't usually get uh, same with Hagen's speech. We don't usually get the owners, um, even when we're handing out, I was just going to say massage licenses, but that seems inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> but I said it anyway. Um, we don't usually get people showing up, so it's, it just shows another level to us, and I think that's a, a wonderful thing, and we're thrilled. And I, I would just want to mention, too, you know, you made that last comment about that you were going to make sure you're closed at nine, and you're being respectful of your neighbors, and um, that's so huge um, because one I know it can impact your business I know that you know people usually buy liquor later at night and that's where you get a lot of your revenue is with with liquor sales um, but the fact that you are um, respecting your neighbors and the community <coughs> down there is is really big and it really goes along with a lot of work that we're trying to do and um, you know uh, Councilor Donovan and has been working on a neighbor neighborhood thing and um, so I, I really value that and I appreciate that and I appreciate the comment that you made and um, you know I hope that others can can join in on that so thank you council member comments council Chiasma. and I appreciate the samples <laughs> <laughs> council Donovan. Uh, yeah uh, the uh, Bailey's proposal was in front of the planning board this week uh, they added some space parking space to the right rear of the building nine additional spaces uh, increase the capacity from 72 uh, uh, seats to 100 seats and that was approved by the planning board this week mm -hmm. so uh, they've now added some valuable parking thank you okay. any other comments not seeing any all in favor and that is unanimous there is no old business moving on to new business order number 17-30 it's the first reading and scheduled public hearing on the proposed fiscal year 2018 municipal and school budget. Usually we open this up to public comment um, before we get started, but what I would like to do, I find that it's more informative if we see the presentation and then open it up to public comment. Um, so we'll turn it over to the town manager and the superintendent for the presentation. Thank you. We are going to do a shared presentation this evening, so appreciate the, the choreography required with shifting in uh, from the place here. But um, as the title suggests, uh, we really want to embrace this one town, one budget approach. And I think this is the third year where I've shared the responsibilities with the superintendent to provide the presentation. And actually this year we're t going to approach it uh, a little differently. In the past, many of you have been in this audience. It's a fairly long presentation, numbers driven. We really tried to dial back out and provide a, a bit of a higher level conversation. I will point out uh, with the large crowd, we may have gone through all the copies, but there was a one page sheet of paper. Does that look familiar? People have it? Okay. Uh, if not, we can certainly provide more 
uh, this evening. But that's something that uh, Julie and I may refer to as we go. This really provides kind of the, the number side of things. So again, tonight we'll, we intend to have, provide a, a bit of a higher level narrative. We have uh, the next six or seven weeks program for detailed, very detailed budget discussion where we'll be diving very deep into the document. And we really don't see that to be a, uh, an appropriate use of time this evening. So uh, bear with us. Um, as we start tonight, this is the product of many months of work uh, with Julie and her senior staff and, and me as well. Uh, and we have this budget to a point where we need to kind of widen the conversation and include other voices in it. There's going to be some challenges, I would, I'll would, predict, uh, not a great uh, prediction. Um, but that, those challenges can be worked through, and we look forward to that conversation. So unlike past years where we kind of end with the bottom line, we're going to start with the bottom line. Um, this is a quick little overview that really kind of lays it out there for you. Um, as many in this room will recall, the finance committees of both the school and the town have been collaborating very closely over the last two or three budget cycles. And really the model that's developed out of that relationship has been kind of a recognition uh, to get to a point of 3% or less in tax rate increases. And the building blocks essential to get there have to do with how much, how we control our spending. And the real story, and I'm, I'm pleased to stand and, and report this to you tonight, is that uh, the building blocks of that model are firmly in place. Uh, the town is coming in under 3% on the expense side. The school is equally doing its job under 5%. That's kind of where we expect it to be, where we need to be to reach that target. The real difference this year is that we've got challenges on the revenue side. That's kind of an age-old broken wheel, uh, squeaky wheel standing at the podium. Uh, but again, it's, it's our biggest challenge and the thing that's throwing our model a bit out of whack. Uh, so what you see before you here is the net budget is going up about uh, $4.7 million, uh, and that's a combination of expenditure increases and loss of revenue, uh, particularly non-property tax revenue. And that equates to about a 7.8% increase in the net request. That's the amount to be raised through property tax. The middle um, row there is an estimate of valuation uh, expectation for next year. And essentially, we're, we can expect a range of that between about 0.65% increase to almost 2%. It's going to fall somewhere in there. That's a number that is derived by the assessor and only the assessor and will be known after this budget is done. But it's an important part of the conversation, uh, undoubtedly. And those two factors together uh, put us in a position to project what the mill rate might be. And right now we're at 1592. Uh, we'll likely be in the high 16s or low 17s if everything stays as it currently is schedule. So there's clearly some work to do. Uh, we hope that everyone doesn't get scared by that uh, initial reaction, that we stay engaged in this process, and I'm confident we can get through it. So quickly, how the budget's built. I think I, I touched on it slightly before. We start in uh, December. Uh, it starts with the uh, finance office and the HR department doing detailed revenue, uh, excuse me, uh, payroll projections, which is a big part of our budget. Those are kind of the big building blocks. Departments, uh, department heads work through their department budgets and submit those to me in mid to late February. And then I have the better part of a month uh, to kind of make sense and understand it all um, as one piece. And I'm going to turn it over to Julie to talk about uh, the school side of that equation. Sure. So our process is also a very collaborative process that starts in December. Um, with some informal pre-budget meetings where we're working with our 21-person our leadership council. Um, and this work is primarily guided, at least this year, it was primarily guided for um, by Kate Bolton, our business manager, who um, was an amazing coach to me. It's my first time doing this um, as your new superintendent. But then also really guiding the whole leadership council through the process. So what we do is really go through a series of phases to get to the proposal that you see before you tonight. Um, and we start with that, that pre-budget work where we're reflecting on our goals that are aligned to our 24-month improvement plan. Um, we're looking at personnel deeply. This year we took a K-12 approach and looking at our, pers our existing personnel, it's 76% of our budget, so we wanted to really be crystal clear about what the skills and attributes are that we look for in every single employee in the Scarborough Public Schools. 
Um, and we took, we thought it was important to take that time to really calibrate our thinking around that as we make decisions about who is going to be renewed, um, who we need to grow, and how we can best support our staff. And then we also looked at our enrollment projections, um, trying to see if there were any uh, efficiencies that could be found in terms of, you know, class sizes or um, just programming across the district. So that's sort of the, the prep work um, that started back in December. And then um, the three phases, the first phase I would call level services, um, the status quo phase of our budget, and that's where uh, Monique Colbertson, Colbertson, our Director of Curriculum and Instruction, myself and Kate Bolton, sat with every single principal and department leader uh, to really look at what, what does it cost to do business um, much in the same way that we've been doing business. And so, of course, um, when we look at level services, that doesn't mean that there's no increases in that budget. So when I say status quo, I'm really talking about maintenance of programming, but um, there are some cost increases that come with that. And a lot of questions, particularly for me this year, um, really asking our leadership to help me understand their internal thinking and this part of the process was really important um, as your new superintendent because it gave me a chance to hear how people are prioritizing things within the school department, but also um, to begin to start to think creatively about um, the way we could do things maybe a little more efficiently while also maintaining the effectiveness of the work that we do. And then in the second phase, um, this is called the student-centered phase in the budget book that you have before you. Um, I like to think of it as the innovation phase. And this is where I ask our leadership to, to think really big um, and without boundaries. So I really wanted them to, to think about their individual schools and departments and what do you need to really accelerate improvement in your individual department or building. Um, and, and as they did that, they developed written proposals to Kate and I, um, and then they presented their proposals to the entire leadership council. And what this allowed us to do was then sort those prior priorities, what's high priority, what's mid, what's low, um, but really having that district-wide perspective so that um, one building's <coughs> needs or one phase level's needs were not outweighing another's. Um, and I think that that's a process similar to what has always been done here in Scarborough, um, just maybe a little slightly different, having me involved and in asking a lot of questions. That's the theme. <laughs> and then the third phase um, is really looking at those priorities and developing the mission critical budget. And so for me, this is like oxygen. What do we need to ensure that our students are getting the high quality education that not only they need, but that they deserve? And so um, a lot of scrubbing goes on from <laughs> the beginning to the end, a lot of um, thinking and rethinking and challenging of, of our thoughts among the leadership council so that we could really make sure that we were being um, reasonable and developing a budget that was fiscally sound, but also a budget that's credible and that we can be sure is going to deliver the type of educational program you expect in Scarborough. <laughs> Um, so next, we're going to talk a little bit about our primary budget drivers, and Tom and I are going to kind of dance back and forth in this um, as we first talk about contractual obligations. So on both the town side and the school side, um, we have contractual obligations to our personnel. And so, uh, like I said before, 70 percent, 76% of our budget is um, related to personnel uh, needs services, and almost all of our staff are under uh, collective bargaining agreements. And so um, based on the ongoing commitment here in Scarborough to create a salary guide for our teachers and other staff that is competitive and allows us to recruit and retain teachers, this is a big um, driver for us this year as we just settled a new three-year teacher's contract. Um, and so you're realizing the impact of that contract here um, in this budget. And we're currently also negotiating two other contracts with our school bus drivers and our support staff. Um, so we feel that you know these contract obligations not only are a part of the budget that um, we, we expect every year because we have negotiated them in that way, they're also really important to ensuring that we're drawing the best and brightest talent to Scarborough. Okay. 
All right. Um, so the other common driver for for both the town and the school side are significant increases to the health insurance costs. Health insurance costs. So this looks a little different for the town than it does for the schools. Um, this year we're budgeting 5.5%. Uh, this is an item that obviously is still in motion as we don't have those numbers quite yet. Um, but the way that Kate budgets this for us and plans this is looking at a four-year average. So just to kind of give you some context, last year it was 8.8%, um, but we're looking at 5.5% this year based on that average. I'll speak to mine. Okay. All right. Um, and then with state revenues, again, another moving target, but uh, of course one of the things that you're going to hear is that um, general purpose aid continues to not be adequately funded um, and then also there have been some changes that have been proposed in the EPS formula through the governor's biennial budget so for us we're realizing um, a, a large loss in revenue here in Scarborough and we're going to talk about that a little bit later on and then another common driver is our debt service so for the public schools our debt service makes up 12 percent of our budget um, and that is a slight decline um, from last year right now, but it's important to notice that we haven't yet included the May 2017 figures um, in that calculation. Great. Thank you. So uh, drilling down a bit further on the town side and then Julie will speak to the school. Uh, Julie alluded to uh, health care costs, whereas they're programming 5.5%, we're at 15%, and there's some unique challenges we've, we're experiencing there. I would note that in our trust, we still enjoy the lowest rates of anyone in the trust, mm -hmm. but we're actually experiencing a large rate increase for us this year for a number of reasons. Uh, we have the pleasure and privilege of Councillor Hayes being chairman of the Finance Committee and uh, is also a professional in healthcare costs and, and management, so I've had the occasion to have him sit with our trust representative to understand some of those dynamics, and I'm sure he'll share that with his colleagues. Uh, but that's a real pressure point and a driver for us this year. We have some very modest increases in staff. Uh, the library is looking to increase from a part-time position into a full-time, and there's associated benefits. Uh, we're looking for a part-time person for inspections in code. Uh, as this council is aware, we have a fair amount of development activity in the horizon and want to make sure that we're staffed appropriately to be able to handle that. Incidentally, there's offsetting revenue that would cover that position. Uh, and then there, we also are including a COLA and merit. Uh, this is for non-union staff, and it's consistent with some policies that uh, prior councils have put in place in terms of those programs. So we'll now move to the school side. So one of our drivers in the school department, again, personnel, it's that reoccurring theme. What we did was look at um, how could we realign resources after doing a really deep systemic analysis of how we're currently using our staff, but also how the work has shifted. Um, we've been able to realize uh, and, and reallocate or realign 7.5 FTEs within the system, um, which is creating some, some ideas around innovation and is going to allow us to, to address some of the biggest needs that we have. And then we also have some new investments that we are needing in order to really do the work that's in front of us. Um, and that's 4.8 new FTEs that we're looking for in this budget. Um, the use of fund balance is also a driver for us. Uh, we have some fund balance that we had uh, planned to use in, in this coming year. Uh, the challenge I think that we're noticing is that loss in revenue that is going to um, have a greater impact than what we had anticipated. And then of course the state and federal mandates that are always looming in the distance for us as public schools. Um, two of the big ones would be Maine PERS. It continues to fall on the schools um, to fund that at an increased rate and then also looking at the transition from our traditional um, s educational system to a proficiency-based educational system. And of course the driver behind that work is personnel and professional development needs. Okay. Sure. Um, so one, one of the things you've been hearing me talk about is this loss in revenue. Um, so we are officially a minimum receiver, and I wanted to just take a moment to tell you a little bit about what that means. Um, and so what you see here in this chart is our state subsidy over time, um, starting back in 2009 to this current year in 2018. Um, so this current year we're realizing a $1.4 million reduction that actually puts us in that minimum receiver status. 
Um, and what that means is, according to statute in Maine, there's a, a, there's a, a floor, if you will, or a minimum amount that um, the Department of Education has to provide to us. So when they calculate our state subsidy, which is a really complex formula that I won't dig deep into tonight, but I'm happy to talk more about um, as we go through this process, but when they calculate um, what it costs to educate children in Scarborough, um, they actually come in under that minimum amount and the, and the amount that they would be allocating to us. And so then there's two other factors that, that bring it up to where we currently are, which is this 2.1 million, which is either our pure pupil cost or our special education cost. Um, and so for Scarborough, the factor that brings us back up to 2.1 million is, is our special education um, needs in the district that gets calculated at 33%. So I, I like to call this the new normal. I mean, the good news with this is that we've kind of bottomed out. And what that brings with it is some consistency and it removes the volatility. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to make the correction entirely in this year, though I think we're bottoming out. And that's really due in, in part to the use of fund balance um, somewhat artificially in this budget. Um, and that's something that we talked about at great length, so it could, should come as no surprise. But it is pushing off. We'll have a similar challenge, I'll predict, next year, kind of the same order of magnitude, if you will. But as we look beyond that, I, I do think um, it's going to be a bit easier year, year to year removing that volatility from the equation. Um, essentially, the $5 million that's shown in this chart um, essentially is a tax shift. It, uh, funding from the state comes from a different market basket of revenues from income and sales uh, derived totally differently. Um, and when that money goes away, it's largely born on the back of a, the local property taxpayer. And that tax shift, uh, thankfully, looks to be nearly complete, but it's been painful. It's been a uh, not just a predictable, but a fairly <coughs> steady decrease uh, year after year after year. So. If there is a silver lining, the end's in sight in that regard. On the positive side of things, we have some very positive trends. Our local economy continues to be strong, and for the foreseeable future, I don't see that changing. Uh, this budget includes, yet again, some extra additional money in excise revenue, which is an indicator of local economy, and that's been one thing that's helped us uh, during some of these challenging times. So there's some, certainly some very good things in our future. We've got a couple years to um, to, to be thinking strategically about and uh, getting to that future point where it's going to be a bit easier year to year. I'd like to just predict some of the areas and, and maybe suggest there are some areas that I suspect the finance committees uh, independently and jointly um, should and, and will talk about in the course of the next five or six or seven weeks. Uh, of course, there's huge uh, state budget implications. And unfortunately, if history suggests anything uh, with a biennial budget, I don't expect we'll have answers from Augusta before you're asked to vote on a final budget. And that's, a, that's unfortunate and that's a challenge. Uh, we may get some clarity as the process unfolds. Um, a couple of the big areas, certainly Julie, Julie has alluded to the GPA. Frankly, I don't expect that money is going to magically appear. Uh, there might be some small modification. It's not going to be the, the full answer by any stretch. Uh, the homestead exemption, um, my budget proposal has it still at 50%. It's actually uh, programmed to go to 62.5% reimbursement. So there's some extra money there, but there are multiple bills currently in the legislature that are questioning that. So that conversation will be informed as we go, and I expect it will be good news, frankly. Use of fund balance. Uh, we have programmed uh, a higher than average use of fund balance really because of the unique situation with the unspent project funds from Wentworth. Uh, there are additional funds that can and probably should be talked about. But there are consequences of further use of fund balance that uh, we've had and will continue to have. But th that's an area that I predict and, and hope you do talk about. Service levels. I've assumed uh, current levels of service are what you're, what you're looking for. If we're looking for uh, reducing costs, um, we'll be looking at reducing service levels. And so that conversation really needs and demands a wider audience to be part of that. There are consequences of that. So I look forward to and in invite that conversation should you want to have it. And lastly, uh, one thing that Julie and, Judy, Julie and I are very proud of is that this budget really contains all the reconciliations that have been talked about for the last three or four or five years. 
It, for the first time, funds food service fully. Uh, it, um, from a capital budget point of view, we're funding more by way of appropriation than ever before. So we're trying to wean ourselves off of short and long-term financing. We're also switching many capital items into the operating budget, uh, particularly on the school side. Uh, I know there's an extra $100,000 for their annual tech refresh. refresh. Uh, those are important things that we've talked about, but we've never actually done. This budget actually does it. Uh, whether all of those things are able to survive in the end remain to be seen. There'll be discussion points for sure. <coughs> so, oh, I still stay. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things about how to navigate our budget book. Um, there's some 250 pages. I don't expect everyone's going to read cover to cover, but we really intend this to be something for everyone. We've added a number of enhancements this year, um, including a, a, a very much enhanced summary and analysis section. Uh, historically, I've put a lot of this content in my budget transmittal letter and haven't done a great job of it, frankly. And thank, thanks to this council, uh, with the addition of an assistant town manager position with some expertise in this area, we've been able to really enhance uh, that whole summary analysis, and I hope you find it enjoyable. In addition, we've added, um, you might think it's a bit cartoony, but it's kind of an at-a-glance piece. And this is true of the school and every one of the town departments. These are just interesting little facts. Uh, some of it's budget-related, sometimes it isn't. Again, this is intended, depending on the audience, uh, a very quick sense of what that department does and what are the things that make it work. Uh, it isn't intended to be... Uh, anything to make decisions with, but it's just an added benefit to the user, to the reader. And lastly, uh, as we've done in the past, there's certainly a thorough and complete budget detail, uh, including line item detail on both the town and school side. We've uh, continued the practice of providing what I hope is a uh, helpful narrative to help you understand what departments do and why they do it, what their goals are for the future, and that's really what this budget is. Uh, it's a bunch of... Uh, priorities expressed uh, through numbers in many respects. And uh, I hope you find it useful. Uh, incidentally, the PDF of this document is up and available on the budget <coughs> portal as we speak. We'll make future enhancements in terms of links and such uh, in the next couple of days, but it's, it's all up there for the viewing should you want to do it. I think this is you. And so I'm going to talk with us a little bit about how to stay engaged throughout the process. I think one of the best tools that you have at your disposal is the budget portal. Um, come check it out regularly. This is really your one-stop shop for all things related to the budget, um, the town and the school side. So we're really proud of the budget portal and all of the efforts that the staff take to keep it up to date so that you have access to as much information as you want to digest and can. Um, it's all right there for you. We also have our budget forum coming up on April 26th from 7 to 9, and this year it's going to be at Wentworth. Um, so we encourage all of our community members to submit questions. I believe the link is already up on the budget portal, so you can begin submitting your questions. Um, and we plan to uh, stick with the format that we've done in the past because the recent survey that we did said that everyone who was able to attend really liked that format and thought that it worked well. So that's an opportunity to come and engage and get some questions answered on April 26th at Wentworth from 7 to 9. And then, of course, the school budget validation vote. This will take place on June 13th. You have a 12-hour window to come out and vote um, from 8 to 8, and that will take place at the Scarborough High School. Okay. Um, and so here are also some key dates, and if you did get one of the handouts, it's on the back of your handout, so you can hang it right on your refrigerator and be reminded of all the ways that you can come and be involved. Um, and I'm not going to read this to you, but again, this is also posted on our website um, at that budget portal, so we just we really want to be transparent and open and encourage dialogue around the budget. This is truly um, an honor to be a part of a community that is so collaborative, and when we say one town, one budget, that's really, um, really what we mean. So I'm honored to be here and be a part of it and hope that you get involved. Just a, a closing comment. Um, it's a challenging starting point. I, there's no question about it. Um, 
I think Julie and I have done a credible job of getting it uh, started, if you will. In many respects, I'd like to think my work is done, but it's just starting. And for everyone else, it is very much just starting. So we stand here ready with our staff to help support you as you go through your deliberations. And I'm convinced the good hard work you've done over the last three or four years of working together and understanding uh, we're all in this together will get us through it, uh, ultimately. Um, so this evening, you'll be asked to consider the budget in first reading. I know that's often an uncomfortable position. You've not even seen it. You've heard us just say a few things. You might have some sticker shock, but uh, really for the, for the process, we do ask you to pass it in first reading and, and initiate it. And uh, I look forward to working with you over the next uh, seven or eight weeks before final reading. Thank you. So as soon as Tom and uh, Superintendent <coughs> are, um, we're now going to open this up to public comment. Um, if anybody that would like to speak on the budget and the presentation, um, if you'd like to come up to the podium, um, this is the public comment section um, for your, uh, your time. Anybody would like to get up and speak? We're all here for the samples on the food handlers license, I think. <laughs> We have someone coming. And uh, given the numbers here, if we have uh, several people that would like to speak, if you are welcome to uh, just uh, get in line. <laughs> name and address, yes. If you can say your name and address, that would be wonderful for the clerk. Yeah, so I'm Sarah Mullen. I live at 55 Gunstock Road. And I just want to say that uh, thank you to all of you guys for all of your hard work to you guys uh, in the school and the leadership council, I think you said. Um, I know how hard this is, and we really appreciate it. And I really appreciate the efforts to keep it at or above level services. I think that's so important, particularly for the schools, certainly for all the, the town services. Um, and that's it. I just, I'm very supportive of this budget, and I want to thank everyone for all their work. Thank you. Thank you. Drew Stevens, I'm at 6 Surrey Lane. Um, is it too late to get a liquor license? <laughs> <laughs> Are you bringing samples? <laughs> um, I just want to say that I really appreciate the one town, one budget um, <coughs> sentiment that uh, I believe last year was the first year that this started, and I think it's, it just makes a lot more sense as a way to approach the budget. Um, so thank you for doing that again, and I hope that uh, we have a really great budget process and smooth and friendly. Thanks. Thank you. Alex Mayberduk um, from Bayberry Lane. And uh, also love the presentation. Thank you for all the work that's gone into putting it together and for the budget proposals. Um, I really can't say enough about this chart, um, the one that's on the spreadsheet. I mean, that is pretty remarkable that we've gone from uh, $7 million, which I believe was still not 55% of what the state owed us even at that point, to $2 million for the 2018, um, just slightly over that. Um, that is scandalous, um, and I think just speaks to, I think, you know, why we deal with so much frustration around uh, budgets at the municipal level. Um, and I think it's also just really telling that when you look at this, I think, you know, the expenditure percentage change at 4.5%. Clearly, the city and the schools are doing their fair job. They're doing amazing work, you know, trying to keep costs under control um, and uh, probably at the expense of both staff and students. And to me, the only thing I can see here you know, when you look at sort of like the net percentage changes, what the real driver is, is that 19% loss um, in the education revenue. And it just is like, I don't know, it's the girl in the room, I know it was stated up there. I find it terribly frustrating because we've had three referendums now in Maine to fund 55% and yet we still have legislators that are working to undermine the will of the voters and make sure that uh, that money never reaches the schools or uh, the property tax relief that um, obviously our municipalities desperately need. Um, and I'm particularly frustrated just because, you know, we actually have one legislator who's actually submitted a bill to have yet another referendum um, 
uh, next year on what on the exact same language that we voted on last year. So I just I don't think we're being um, yeah. I thank everybody for the amazing work that they're doing in a situation which you've been set up for failure. So thank you. Thank you. Ben Howard, Seven Windsor Pines. Um, I, th I think the, what I saw from the clips of the budget looks great. I definitely will spend a lot of time going through that in the next couple of weeks to be more ready for the second reading than I, than I was tonight. Um, the points that really uh, that I'll be looking into that were brought up tonight was the 76% um, of the school budget being with teachers. To me, it sounds a little bit high, and I, and I know I'm not, I'm not going to get a lot of likes here tonight with a, a lot of uh, school school board people out, um, but it, the number seems a little bit high to me. Definitely in an age of um, the Internet, there's a lot of, lot of free resources to learn. Um, I mean, even being out of school, I think college is a little bit expensive because of the fact that I can go on and go on to places like Khan Academy and watch pretty interactive lessons and, and use these resources for free. So um, I know it's very important that we continue to pay our teachers to draw those things in, but are we doing research as to different ways to potentially teach to outdo these free online services that could potentially you know, take a lot of kids out of the school system as is, and people are going to start taking more money out of, uh, you know, asking to take more money out of the education budget as they are now homeschooling the kids as opposed. Um, the other topic is that I, I actually love that graph, the fact that the state gives us less and less money. Um, to me, like uh, was mentioned, I think that's great because it starts to suggest that, you know, this town can support ourselves. And my question there would be, um, is there any numbers in that budgetary book that is potentially, let's just say the state cuts us off of all money. What does our budget look like then? I don't know if that's a possible statistic to look up, but that would be amazing to just see uh, the ability of the town to stabilize itself and hold together. So um, I look forward to reading the budget and uh, boring myself for multiple nights, but it, it'll be fun to come out and uh, definitely engage the council and discuss the topic. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stacy Newman. I live at 17 Windsor Pines Drive. I think that the town is part of the state, and so I certainly hope that the state doesn't negate its entire obligation like it seems to do to help support our education. I am pleased with this budget. I think that this shows that our town is really, to quote Harry Truman, saying the buck stops here, and we are not going to totally deplete our students of the funding that is necessary to provide them with a good, valuable, and interactive education. One thing that is excellent about our schools is their uh, continued use of online, internet, forward-thinking, innovative uh, technology, and I think that they're doing an excellent job with that. So I hope that you will support this budget. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Larry Hartwell, 9, Puritan Drive. Um, I don't know where to start, but I wish we had some more graphs and some charts, and I wish I had some here I could hold up for you. Uh, 2012, that was not ancient history, is it, by any, any stretch of the imagination? So since 2012 to 2017, the inflation has gone up 7%. Our tax rate, our spending, our gross operating appropriation that comes off this sheet here. I use those numbers. It's grown by 37 percent. 37 percent. Um, using the town numbers there. Uh, I think we need to stop and pause, look at it at the 10,000 foot level. Inflation continues to run at 1 percent, 2 percent a year. Um, I'm not going to talk about the the school budget tonight, because this is the town council, you're the folks that set the number. You set the number for the town. You set it for the school budget, uh, the school department. Um, the first reading, uh, this is, I've been to a couple of these before, and it's always, I'm always told it's meaningless. You know, it's, it's just a perfunctionary thing that we do. 
in how many people in the audience or at home know that we're talking about a, a gross budget of 92.8 million dollars is the total gross budget I suspect there's a number of people sitting at this table here that don't know that that's the number that you're voting on for tonight and they were always talk about okay we're gonna have all these meetings and we're gonna pare it down historically we've seen very little happen there on 92 million dollars we may come back two months from now, it's down to 200,000, 300,000. We spend a lot of time, the council spends a lot of time looking and, and analyzing various things that come before them. Um, here, the numbers presented tonight, you're supposed to just pass it. I expect it will be passed. My only question is, will it be unanimous? I think that's the only <coughs> thing out there. Uh, the transparency part and, and having transparency, a good concept. You, you came up with the budget portal. Um, the presentation tonight that we saw was put, uh, put on the website after the meeting started at 7 o'clock tonight. There's been no information available to the public through the portal. And we've had, uh, we've had several budget committee meetings and really no numbers there, nothing for the public to, uh, to analyze. So I think it's, uh, I think it's, would be a poor thing on your part to just simply vote and approve almost $93 million tonight. I think it, at a minimum you'd say, oh, it doesn't really matter. Well, okay, then cut that number by $4 million and start there since it doesn't matter and, and see what happens in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, that's all for tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else that would like to speak? Paula O'Brien, Pondview Drive. Um, I just recently found out, and I don't know how many people in this room know, that tomorrow um, legislation may be introduced that will actually cut the excise tax available to towns. So I don't know a lot about it, but that, you know, may be less revenue for the towns as well. As far as the whole budget concerns, um, you know, I, I just, again, I just feel for the seniors and those on fixed incomes in this town. You know, when you have an increase of, of 9.7.36%, you know, they got zero increase with Social Security, zero. And I, I want to commend Councillor Foley and St. Clair and Pierre Hayes and Chiazzo for having the round table. That was a really, I think, uh, eye-opening experience in, in the discussions that were held there. And anyway, that's, that's my take. Thank you. Anybody else that would like to speak? Going once, twice. We'll close the public comments. Um, turn it over to the manager for procedural purposes uh, to start our conversation. I believe I need to read into the uh, read a motion. Yes, we prepared a budget motion for you. It was uh, presented in your packets. We've made a couple of small changes that are for the good. They're not terribly large. They don't really make a material difference. And if it pleases the council, we could either you could either consider those amended numbers this evening, or we could pick it up at second reading. Whatever your serves your pleasure, Chairman. I have handouts that show the two changes. There are additional revenues, and so it reduces the net amount. But again, not appreciable. Um, it would just be getting us started in the right direction. They're on the back of this sheet. Right. And you'll see strike through and underline. So um, this is my first time being Did chaired doing this, so I do not want to read two pages of single-lined text um, if I don't have to. What parts should I read to in order to have a motion? Well, there's only... Do well, I, I mean, or do I need to read the whole I, thing? I don't recall anyone's ever read this in, no. frankly. Do mm -hmm. you remember? No. no. Okay. <coughs> and if it pleases the council, the, the changes in revenue and therefore uh, reducing that appropriation have to do with just fine-tuning the Betty reimbursement and the Homestead reimbursement numbers. Uh, we just had some more uh, updated information come early this week. So what I would like to, I mean, be, um, at least to get, so, um, 
Before, yeah, in order to, um, I would like to at least read this one line because I think it at least summarizes the budget mm -hmm. for what we're talking about, which is on the reverse second page. Mm -hmm. um, so as part of, and this is the numbers piece. Um, be it further ordered that the total gross budget of $92,855,509, this total less ex estimated revenues and other credits of $28,024,075 results in a net appropriation of $64,831,434, which shall be raised from taxation. So that's really the basis that we will um, accept a motion, and then we can have a conversation and discussion about public reading, if you don't mind. Thank you. Is so there a moved. motion? So moved. And a oh, second. Se second. And what I would like to do is maybe turn it over to uh, Councillor Hayes if there's any um, report from the Finance Committee or any update from you as the Chair of the Finance Committee before we get started. Um, <coughs> not per se. I mean, we, okay. you know, as, uh, as suggested, we're just seeing it, but yeah. the only update would be we have some work to do and we'll be going over the budget for the next month um, and looking at them. Okay. Um, council member comments <coughs> on the motion for uh, reading. Are we doing comments? Discussion? Discussion. Oh, comments? Sorry. Yeah. Discussion, comments. Do you want to go first? No, we're good. Oh, oh, I'll go first then. I guess. Sure. <laughs> Great. Um, I don't know which is better, first or last. Um, so I ha I do have to give um, major kudos to the um, superintendent and the new superintendent and the town manager. Um, I think we've come a long way from where we were. Um, is it where I want to be? No. Um, but that's not because I don't want what we need in the schools. Um, and that's the difference. And I think that's something that you talked about, Julie, was um, you know, wants versus needs. And that's a really um, big deal. Um, I'm very concerned about our seniors in this town. Um, we did have a round table discussion a few weeks ago. And that was something that we really talked about um, and how much better we need to do for them so that we can provide what we need in our schools without having to have people upset or people worried that they're going to lose their homes. Um, one thing I definitely want to say is that you can't always believe everything that you read. Um, and I would caution people while we go through the budget process that if there's a question or a concern or you read something or you see something that you think might be off, please contact a school board member or a council member directly or the town manager or um, the superintendent and we'll clarify things for you. It's so easy that things can um, get lost in translation sometimes. And I saw two or three, two or three things this morning um, and this afternoon that was just out in the cyber world about the budget that wasn't, I didn't, I hadn't even seen the budget yet, so I didn't really know how we got to that point. Um, so just make sure that you're following up and asking the questions. That this, the council and the school board has worked really hard this year to, to really make sure that we're presenting um, really truly one budget and that we're making sure that everybody's getting what they need and it's hard to do that when you feel like you're fighting against um, things that are out there that aren't the truth of what we're trying to present. So um, I think this is a starting point. This is what happens every year. But I have to say that in the six years that I've been here, oh God, that's getting old saying that, isn't it? <laughs> um, this is by far, the, I think, the, the best place we've been. Um, it's a budget that I can stand behind tonight and, and proudly stand behind it. I don't feel, um, feel bad about that. I feel proud of it. Um, and I feel proud of the work that both finance committees have done. I know it's not easy. And it's not easy when we're constantly up against losing money. I mean, in a perfect world, we'd get back all the money that the state continues to take away from us. But there are people that we can start holding accountable for that, and that's something that we need to really start doing. Um, but that's another topic for a different day. Uh, but I, 
for tonight, I'm really happy with this. And I'm, and I'm proud of the work that you guys have all done. And I very, very, very much appreciate, um, Julie, what you've done and accomplished with your group and um, also with you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. It's really well put together. And I have to say that just this is the first, my first night with it um, and quickly going through it. I know it looks big, um, but it is by far the clearest um, and easily to na easy to navigate budget I've seen so far. So that's a huge help. Thank you. Anybody else? Comments? Councilor Rowan. Um, so if, if you could indulge me for just a second. Um, I wanted to, while we have the school audience, um, I just wanted to make a, a express my appreciation to the administration and, and to the uh, administration of the high school in particular. I don't know if those of you who are aware, but <coughs> there was a programming today um, at the high school um, where there was a, a presentation of a movie and a, a discussion group after the fact um, around um, social and emotional and mental uh, health well-being of those students. And I just wanted to say how much I appreciate that. I think that's a, an incredibly important part of the curriculum when we're raising young men and women in our community to, to address that, even if it's only you know, one day a year. Um, so thank you. Uh, my next point um, was, um, you know, just to try and clarify about how this process works. Um, uh, the uh, town staff and, and school staff have been working on their budget for um, a number of months. Um, this is the first time that it's presented to us as well, so I understand uh, the frustration that the presentation go on the on the board until after this meeting started. But, um, um, but you know, this is the first time we've we've seen it as well. We didn't see this budget until today. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I had another really important point uh, before I launched into my diatribe. Oh, uh, the other point was that um, there are um, inflationary pressures on municipalities and uh, school districts um, that uh, are different than general inflation when you look at baskets of goods, and Scarborough is not unique in that uh, growth in operating funds. Um, it's um, it's there are very different cost drivers that hit when, you, when you're dealing with an organization that is 76% cost driven by labor. Um, uh, but now I want to turn my focus on the, the, um, the, the uh, general purpose allocation for education that we're receiving. Um, that $2.1 million, um, that is reduced by uh, $1.4 million of what we got last year. Um, that's the biggest loss we've seen. If you look at that chart, I mean, and that's on top of a million dollar loss last year um, in revenue. I think we're, um, um, if you look at a $1.4 million, um, the revenue that we have to raise to offset that, that's uh, almost half of this increase. It's not quite half, it's about uh, 40 cents, I believe, in a tax rate. Um, but it's really significant. Um, and, you know, you, you talk about that formula, um, it's incredibly complicated. Um, and there are any number of inputs that go into it, and, and if you look at um, the, the allocation that they're making before they do a correction, so when they talk about this formula, they, they talk about corrections for uh, property tax valuation, and, and uh, they talk about how fair it is to distribute funds um, based on the, capa the capacity of that town to raise funds. Um, but before they take that equating factor between them, they do this crazy co computation about like how much they're allocating to the town uh, for their costs. And if you look at that on a student per student basis, uh, and you compare towns, uh, you, and you look at um, Cumberland, they've, they've determined that, that students in Cumberland um, should be allocated an additional $745 per student. What's, different about, what's so different about Cumberland? They've got similar cost drivers that we have. Um, but something about that formula has said that that's $745 per student. Well, we have 3,000 students in our school department. If you multiply that out, that's... Uh, you're going to make me do math here in public. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're doing it Hold on. South Portland's easier. South Portland's easier <laughs> because they have $1,000 more per student. And if you do that math, it's $3 million. Um, our, our budget situation would look a lot better if we had an extra $3 million in our pocket. Um, and the other thing that I, I do remember my other point, and that was at this time last year at first reading, um, we were looking at a $1.5 million loss from, from GPA. Um, but 
the legislature still in session so call your legislature legislators sorry Chris is making faces at me sorry and but the important thing to notice that that number can change and that number can change significantly I know that there's still a movement to get that funding up to 55% for this year that would be a significant benefit to us it wouldn't change our our allocation rate but it would get us out of a minimum receiver status and get some significant money back to the taxpayer in town that's all I have to say thank you other comments also Denovan as it's been said it's this is the beginning of the process this is the best starting point we've had in the four budgets that I've had to address these past four years the cost increase is about four percent in a normal year our assessed value goes up about one and a half percent other excise taxes and other revenue streams go up modestly and this would be about a two to two and a half percent impact on taxes if this were a normal year we are fortunate that we are nearing the end of a very bad decade with the state of Maine the most massive cost shift that could possibly be imposed upon a town is about to come to an end we have reached minimum receiver status the state can't take this money and give it to others anymore and and we're lucky that we finally reached a point where we will know how much we're going to get it will be a challenge this year and next because of the way in which fund balance monies need to be used but we'll get through it the schools will remain excellent we're never going to let that commitment to this community be diminished but it will be a challenge this year and I'm so proud of our town manager and our new superintendent for the job that they've done thank you just a point of clarity are we discussing just the amendment to the main motion or are we discussing the total budget now I offer it I'm already amended the numbers are already amended in the okay all right then I do have comments so I'll start by doing my best Kevin Bacon impression remain calm all is well okay it's 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 shocking sometimes for some people to see numbers like that I can tell you this is my fourth sorry fifth budget not nice numbers but necessary numbers we have to stop playing the shoulda coulda woulda I wish the state would do this I wish the state would do that this is the reality of our situation you know to the seniors I would say you know don't worry we're not going to forget about you there are programs in place to to help seniors who are really struggling and we'll continue to fund those and we'll continue to make those available to the people who really need that to the parents I would just ask for a little bit of understanding there is good news we have bottomed out but we may have to deal with a level service arrangement for a year or two until we can stabilize and then we can start moving forward we've got to look at all of that stuff I'm very very confident that we have the right people in place on both sides to do that and hopefully the last couple of years we've gained your trust and you'll let us do the work that we need to do and what comes out of that will be the best thing for for all of us because it is one town one budget I think the worst thing that can happen is for people to overreact to what was presented tonight you know it's it's not a perfect world we all see that we all know that but we've got and we've got some work to do and I think we realize that we acknowledge that and I would just encourage people to be you know part of the solution not part of the problem you know let's let's do some work and let's put our heads together and 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 get to a good reasonable compromise that we can all live with so so I want to thank the school board and finance committee for all for all their work it is the best starting point that I've seen in a long time and I can't profess to 
know the numbers off the top of my head, but I, I do recall uh, a few of them. I actually expected to see much higher numbers, believe it or not, um, especially given, you know, the significant loss, the, the 1.4 million. I think Tom kind of hit it on the head. The, the best news about the minimum receivership is that now we have nowhere, we can't go lower than that. So now we know, you know, where we can go forward uh, and start to stabilize. So um, I, I would agree with some of the comments earlier around, so my conflict for me personally in terms of supporting this tonight is simply I feel very ill-equipped to offer a recommendation to make it better or to what I would say, oh, well, you should cut the fire department piece or this because I haven't had my weeks of reading uh, ahead, which I look forward to. Um, so that, that's the only part that, I, that is a conflict for me. It's hard to uh, support something either way. Yes, no, and I, and I know there's a lot of work to come in, in the time in between, um, but I don't like to also vote against something without offering another solution or having a recommendation. So, so that's my conflict, and I'll deal with it, and I'll be okay in the morning. Um, it is double, or more than double, you know, our council goal. Um, that's obviously a concern, um, but I also recognize and understand that goals are just, you know, out there to guide us. Uh, you can't hit a goal every time. I've made many goals in my life that I have not hit. doesn't mean I don't stop trying. So I think there is work that we can all do going forward ahead. Um, so, I, you know, I guess because this is the process that I have to live within, it's, it's what we've been doing. Um, I'm probably going to support it, uh, but if this were the final number tonight, I'd probably be voting against it. That's as plain as I can be in terms of putting my, my cards on the table. So, And it's not because of any one piece, um, because I need to dissect a lot further. Council Hayes. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And I, and I think I'll you know kind of echo everything that's already been said. Um, you know, for me, this really is is the starting point. There's been a lot of hard work by both teams to get us to where we are. This is my third year through the process, and I do disagree a little bit. Every year I've done this, when we get these numbers, we end up coming together as a community, have conversations. We do end up in different places. And actually, I haven't asked tonight. Um, there's been a ton of work that's gone into it to get us here. It is a great starting point. But what I'd really like to ask the community is we need to come together as a community and work on this as a community issue. We have some choices to make. Um, we'd love to have everybody be part of that dialogue, communicate with us as we go along. But what I would hate to see us is to go back to a couple of years ago when we all went into our corners and started you know, having conversations that weren't productive and leading us to solutions. So, you know, the work is just now our work and your work as the community has started. We're going to be having conversations over the next month about choices and what can we do and what do we want to do, what, how can we get this to a place that works for the most. Um, but we need to do that in a civil and respectful way so that everybody's <coughs> listening to each other and we can get to a place that works for the whole community. I just really hope you join us in doing that. That will make our job easier and it will be the best outcome we can get for everybody in the community. So. Stay engaged. Uh, they did a great job. We're, there's lots of different ways to keep informed of where we're going. If you have issues, as, as Council St. Clair said, just give us a call. Talk to us. Um, we'll listen, and we're trying to balance everything we hear to try to get us to a place that works for the, for the community. So thank you, and, and work with us, please. Um, a few comments for, for myself, if you don't mind. Um, <clears throat> first is um, I did want to re re reiterate that the process that is undertaken is one that is prescribed by charter and it's prescribed by our council rules. So the manager's presentation of the uh, town budget, um, including the superintendent's budget, um, is consistent and um, within the uh, prescription that the town charter says. So I don't want anyone to believe that somehow we've done something different by simply accepting it and then having a first reading. The fact is we need to receive it to then direct it back to the town the council's finance committee uh, to have the conversations with the departments about um, their recommendations. So um, we did follow our process. Um, next is, um, you know, every year um, when you go through this budget process, it seems like it's uh, worse than the last year, uh, no matter how good it might be. Um, I've actually been able to uh, survive five superintendents and two managers and ten budgets, and we've always uh, been able to learn from that process. Um, to find a solution and then to move forward. And I really look at, um, so first, um, I really want to thank uh, uh, Mrs. Kuchenberger and Tom 
this is probably the best budget I've seen in the 10 years. It is clear. I did get a chance in preparation for tonight to see a little bit of it in advance. Um, great work coming out of the gate from the superintendent. I think it's um, absolutely incredible the obstacle that you overcame being a, a new to the town. It's mindful and thoughtful. Um, the overall increase is less than last year. Last year was 5.5%, um, and you're at 4.9. I mean, you can't ask for m much more than that, um, given the constraints. And on Tom, you've consistently performed and done well with a 2.9%. There are constraints that um, we need to address. and. Um, one of them is our own council's goal, and goals are important, and to meet those goals are important for the community. But it's also about some policy initiatives that we've taken that are in consideration. So keep in mind the, the presentation. Two major policy initiatives. First is that we are fully funding the food services program that has normally been um, simply um, tasked um, in a deficit situation through the budget process. That is absolutely new and, and one of our goals through the Finance Committee. And then second is the capital improvements and putting more of those improvements into the um, appropriations budget rather than just simply through debt service as long as it made sense and was the right instrument for that. We need to have a serious conversation about those initiatives and whether or not we um, should either um, stick to them or we loosen them while we transition through this minimal receivership and stabilize ourselves. And I know that we'll have that conversation. Um, you know, and I, I wanted to reiterate what uh, Council St. Clair said about um, receiving information, processing it, and then kind of communicating information. Um, you know, I know I, my door is always open. My phone number is listed. You're welcome to give me a call with your um, ideas. Um, but at the same time, I really hope that we're all um, cautiously optimistic about this um, because there are some decisions that have to be made for the community as a whole. Um, I am very pleased with the presentation and, and very pleased in where we're starting. Um, and the fact is, is that for the last three years, we've initiated a new process around the budget, and um, we all knew coming into this year that we are getting exactly what we received from the manager and from the superintendent. And I think that's the biggest achievement from both the town council and the school board is that we're all on the same page and where we are. Um, so, you know, kudos to uh, to the work that we've done as well as the work that we have to do going forward. So, um, I really appreciate that, and I look forward to the conversations. Any other comments? I said yes. <coughs> a question. I, I believe I heard uh, uh, Tom say that the homestead exemption reimbursement that that was. You said you used the 50% number, and, and the expectation is that there there is supposed to be a change to 60. Two and a half. Two and a half percent. So it would be more by way of reimbursement back to us. It's in the order of a couple hundred thousand dollars should it pass. But there are four or five different competing pieces of legislation currently in conversation. So I, I want to be cautious, so we've kept it at 50 percent. I expect that conversation will be informed over the next five to six weeks. I just have one more quick yes. um, I just wanted to follow up on one really quick thing. Um, one thing that we had talked about a couple weeks ago was um, I the senior citizens in our town and, and the struggle that they're dealing with. And, um, you know, some of those struggles are, are, are real. Um, they're choosing between food and heat, um, and there. Are, I hope I hope this comes out right. Um, there, it's not easy to get up at the podium for those of you that have done it and talked. Um, well, it may seem not not like a big deal to some of you. To a lot of people, it's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do. People get nervous or they're embarrassed, or, um, whatever the reason may be. Um, but we have some people in town that are really struggling right now. Um, and we have some people in town that aren't. Um, but I would just really encourage you, um, you know, like one of the commenters said tonight, this is a wonderful outpouring of support for the schools that all of you showed up and it's a beautiful thing. Um, but I would also encourage you to also use some of that passion that you have um, and, you know, maybe find a senior citizen in town that could just use a little bit of a helping hand. It's not a, a difficult thing to do. Um, uh, just some of the stories that I've heard over the last couple of weeks because of some of the dialogue we started is, is heart-wrenching. And um, one of the things that someone said at our roundtable was, you know, we can do better and we deserve, these people deserve for us to do better. And it's not just the schools that need us to do better, it's our whole town that needs us to do better. And we, I think we as a community can do better. I think we will do better. Um, and I think this is a great start. So thank you for being here.
Any other comments? Not seeing any, all in favor of the first reading of the municipal budget. And that is unanimous. Moving on to the next item. Actually, before I do so, um, we're going to continue our business. Um, um, I believe most of you might have an interest in leaving, so I'd like to actually recess for five minutes while you leave. Uh, the chair. <laughs> Keep in mind that um, if you're going to have a conversation, because we do have to come back to business, if you can kind of go further away from the chamber as possible, the voice is carried. But thank you very much, everyone, for coming. We're going to be in recess for five minutes.
Tennessee sanctioned dog show, the Southern Maine Coastal Classic, located at Wisconsin, if I said that right, Springs Campground, scheduled for Thursday, May 19, 2017, through Sunday, May 22, 2017. And I'll open it to public comment. Anybody would like to speak on the item? Not seeing any, I'll accept a motion from the council. So moved. Second. Second. Comments, questions from the council? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that is uh, six, um, and uh, Councilor St. Clair had to leave for an appointment. Um, order number 17-32, act on the request to appoint Angela Blanchett, uh, town engineer, to the Long Creek Board. Uh, this replaces um, outgoing um, planning director Dan Bacon, who will be leaving and vacating that seat. Um, any public comment? Not seeing any, is there a motion from the council? So moved. Second. Any questions? Yes, sir. Really appreciate having uh, Angela Blanchett on the staff. Uh, my contact with her, she's done a really excellent, remarkable job. Excellent. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing any, all in favor? That's unanimous, six to zero. Uh, there are no non-action items, standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. I'll start with Councilor Donovan. I've uh, already reported on the Planning Board meeting. Uh, Energy Committee uh, uh, meeting uh, was uh, very good. The street lighting project, uh, which has really been advanced by four other communities, we're now at a point where we're going to be able to piggyback their efforts. <coughs> uh, and you'll see there is a capital budget item uh, in this budget. Uh, to purchase. There is a payback. I think it's about seven years. And then it's about $100,000 savings a year. So it's fairly substantial money. So uh, uh, you'll see it when you look at the capital budget. Thank you. Councilor Rowan. Thank you. Um, the uh, Historic Preservation Implementation Committee met last night. Um, talked about a number of issues. Um, one of the uh, most important issues that we talked about were uh, some of the tasks and goals that we want to accomplish this year. Um, the, sorry, I have to just log into my notes. Uh, Affordable Housing Committee uh, <coughs> met earlier in the month. Um, we had an opportunity to do, uh, to discuss uh, the Mayberry Report. Dan, one of the reasons I'm going to miss Dan. Uh, he was present, uh, had um, uh, reviewed the Mayberry report, and was suggesting that maybe we didn't need a full-fledged uh, Mayberry re uh, report as part of the conference plan this year because we've implemented a number of the suggestions that were made um, and that perhaps um, uh, there might be something less that we would do in terms of like a housing study. But really, one of the things that Mayberry report had done was not only, uh, not only looked at um, uh, uh, the housing situation, but also what we could do about it. Um, but um, but some of the other recommendations uh, that he was pointing out was that um, um, was that the recommendation. Or, or I've lost that train of thought. There's only about about 10% uh, of you want 10% of your uh, housing stock to be affordable. Uh, therefore, you you kind of have to as you're moving forward. Um, you need to make sure that you know 10% uh, moving forward is, a, is affordable. Uh, the other thing that we discussed at the Affordable um, Housing Committee, excuse me, Scarborough Housing Alliance, um, Avesta um, came by. Um, they have, since they received the uh, main housing uh, tax credit, um, the, uh, the market has changed uh, pretty significantly and uh, they are um, um, facing some uh, difficulties in advancing that project and they want to talk to us about maybe uh, some changes that could be made. Um, so again, it was helpful to have Dan there with his creativity um, and we're going to be meeting again with, with them to talk, <coughs> make a recommendation to this council about maybe some things that could be done. Uh, but significantly, some of the things are the tax credits are worth less now because there's an expectation that um, significant corporate tax relief is coming. Um, so therefore, you don't get the same value when you go and, and you sell your tax credits. Um, and then the other the other uh, issue that they're running into is that um, we're somewhat in the midst of a housing boom, and therefore construction is more expensive uh, than it was uh, 12 months ago. So um, 
so there's some challenges there. The 55-plus uh, advisory program also met. Um, one of the highlights there is that participation numbers are really way up now mm -hmm. that they're meeting at Martin's Point, um, and it's been really helpful, and so they're, they're really appreciative of um, um, uh, Martin's Point for um, hosting us. Um, SEDCO also met. Um, uh, Dan and Angela both came to that. Um, and one of the uh, items being discussed, Angela made a nice presentation about um, some of the potential um, changes that can be made on Route 1 um, that would serve a number of purposes, including uh, uh, runoff and uh, storm, uh, excuse me, uh, water quality protection. Cousin Foley. Okay. Um, <coughs> Eastern Trail Alliance met. I think the biggest piece for them is that folks could be aware of is they are uh, co-hosting uh, what is being called the John Andrews Memorial 5K Walk slash Run. Uh, it's going to start and finish uh, from O'Reilly's Cure uh, and incorporate, I don't know the exact uh, route yet, but it's going to incorporate part of the Easter Trail mm -hmm. and so the funds that are raised uh, will go towards the, their uh, Close the Gap campaign as well as honoring obviously uh, Tremendous citizen of Scarborough. That is going to be on Saturday, May 20th at 9 a.m. Um, you can go to www.active.com to sign up for the race. Um, there's also a link to the race from their Facebook page. So, um, and beverages, samples actually at O'Reilly's Cure afterwards is what I've heard. There is. There are samples. Like yes. So there you oh, go, Chris. Cool. Yeah. Um, you have to run to get that. <laughs> uh, communications. Uh, we did hold the community roundtable. I didn't want to steal Kate's thunder. I thought she would be here to talk about it. We had, uh, I think, 20, 22 people there, um, as well as uh, Councillor Chiazzo joined our committee. And it was really nice to uh, engage our citizens in that way. Uh, it was, you know, we, we pulled tables close and just it, it gave it uh, a real nice <coughs> opportunity for less formal interaction back and forth and to hear what folks have to say and what's on their mind and what they're concerned about. We do plan to continue those. Um, I don't think, I think we've been struggling to find uh, space. So as soon as we have the space we'll, and a date, we will let people know. But uh, thanks to all those who came and hopefully some more will come. That's it for me. Thank you, Councilor Chiazzo. Uh, so, uh, let's see, long range planning met March 24th. Um, we did a, um, we had previously done a tour of Higgins Beach to review um, any necessary adjustments or tweaks to the um, project based or form based zoning to see how things were moving along and progressing and to see the, some of the actual implications of the zoning. It was, I, I thought it was very, very helpful. The consultant, Russ, was with us. Um, we were able to look at some um, some of the impacts of, of what, those, what that zoning um, resulted in and look at, you know, was it achieving really what we were, what we were hoping to do. Um, we did some comprehensive plan updates for um, um, Long Range Planning Committee's role in that and we're actually going to, the Long Range Planning Committee is going to come to schedule a workshop with us May, um, either late May 21st, 23rd, somewhere in there. 22. 22, so I was right in the middle. Um, to do a kickoff meeting with the consultant and um, kind of get us up to speed as a council on uh, what the plan is and moving forward and, and the interaction and that kind of stuff. Um, Dan Bacon was there, it was his last meeting, so we had donuts. Um, then the transportation <laughs> committee. <laughs> then the transportation committee met on March 28th. <laughs> um, we, we went over a couple of projects, we went over the um, Eastern Road striping. Um, they're going to do a resurfacing, I think, this summer. So we, we looked at the striping and whether that was, uh, we wanted to continue along that, that process. And I, I believe we decided that that was going to, to we were going to continue with that. It was a, a positive outcome so far. Um, Gorham Road improvement update. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, improving um, the next phase, I think, is between Pin Oaks and the school. And the um, plans will. Uh, be put out to bid, I believe, in June, um, and then we should be commencing work in there, I think, late summer, for the actual work to come. So, um, looking forward to beginning the phase one of Gorham. And we looked at some future transportation needs for the comp plan, um, things like Route 1 corridor, um, 
um, master plans for Route 1 corridor, things like that. So we're, we're there gearing up for, um, for their input into the comprehensive plan. Um, and Dan Bacon was there, but we did not have donuts. <laughs> <laughs> Um, finally, appointments met tonight, and Dan was not there, so we're, we're clear. We're good with this one. Um, but I do have quite a few things to read into the clerk for the record. Um, uh, for the Board of Assessment Review, um, we had an opening for first and second alternate positions, which were vacant. We had uh, two applicants. March de Sanctus was um, uh, appointed uh, with a, a, as uh, first um, alternate with a position, excuse me, to expire, term to expire in 2018. And Hugh O'Shea uh, was also appointed, I believe, a second alternate with a term to expire in 2019. On Coastal Waters Harbor Advisory, um, we had no new applicants, but we did have two resignations. So we moved Mo Erickson from first alternate to a full voting member with a term to expire in 2019. And Travis Turner from second alternate to a full voting member with a term to expire in 2019. Uh, Parks Conservation Land Board, we had one vacancy. Uh, we appointed Jane Palmer as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2017. Senior Advisory Board, we had a first and second alternate position uh, vacant. We had one applicant, um, again, Ms. Palmer. Um, we appointed her uh, as a first alternate with a term to expire in 2019. Shellfish Conservation had two resignations, um, and we had two applicants, I believe. So what we recommended was to have Dwayne O'Rourke move from the first alternate to a full voting member with a term to expire in 2018 and to appoint Travis Turner as a full <coughs> voting member with a term to expire in 2018 and appoint Will Hamill as a first alternate with a term to expire in 2017. For Zoning Board of Appeals, we had um, uh, an applicant that we moved forward in a due to a resignation. Um, we appointed Rick Loisel um, to the um, Zoning Board of Appeals as a full voting member um, with a term to expire in 2017. And then last but not least, on Coastal Harbors, Coastal Water Harbors Advisory, we appointed uh, Michael Lynch as a first alternate with a term to expire in 2018. So I'd be happy to give those to the clerk for her to enter into the record. And we can um, hopefully pass those at the next meeting. That's all I have. Thank you. Councilor <coughs> Hayes. Yeah, two quick updates. Um, Public Safety Committee met. They, they've moved forward on sort of finalizing the design of, of the station, the, the new Public Safety Building. Also, they have kind of zeroed in on some final sites for its actual location, so that work's progressing along, which is great. Um, and just a quick update for the fi Town Council Finance Committee meeting we're going to have. We had scheduled the meeting Thursday night, tomorrow night. That's been canceled and rescheduled. As Councilor Folia said, we ran into some scheduling issues with space and other scheduling issues, which had to do with a, an event that I forgot about for my wife. That I, <laughs> um, I, I Probably the better choice is to, to accommodate that. Um, so it has been rescheduled to Monday, May 1st. Um, and we will be reviewing the police, fire, and EMS budget and the planning department budget that night. So anybody that had a plan to come, um, it will be rescheduled to, the, to May 1st. Thank you. And uh, just a couple of chairman uh, reports, updates. Um, for the um, library, um, the board, um, I wanted to mention that uh, next Tuesday evening, April 11th, from 4 p.m. to closing, that there is a um, – Public Library uh, fundraiser for, at Pat's Pizza. Uh, would love to see everyone um, uh, go to Pat's Pizza and support our local library. And also that next week is National Library Week. So there's some nice attention for them. Um, I did want to mention to the council and to the public that um, as chair I have received the town manager's um, letter of intent to enter into negotiations for a new contract that was received timely uh, within the uh, specifications and now the council is required to begin on that negotiation process and I believe complete it by June 31st um, and have that contract approved by the council. Um, what I will do is, um, um, so to understand some things that are kind of going on regarding our goals, um, the appointments committee will be recommending hopefully in the near future a ch slight change um, based on our goals uh, to their mission statement and their statement around what they do. Um, and what we are going to be doing is forwarding 
um, this item to the new appointments committee that will take up negotiations and employment contracts as well, help us do the analysis around that contract, because uh, uh, most of us, I believe all of us, none of us, except for maybe Council of St. Clair, have been involved in a contract uh, negotiation with the town manager. I don't think anybody has it. <coughs> I, I never was because I was never chair before. But well, um, don't worry, I'll chair for you. Oh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> wow, something off my calendar finally. Um, no, so um, we're going to do this more. In, um, in the past, just to explain, in the past, the policy is basically the town council chairman is the negotiator, and you know, I kind of. Uh, you know, just ask everyone what they want and sit down one-on-one -on -one with the manager and kind of uh, do the contract. And I'm a little bit more inclusive, and so I'd like to take this from a team approach and have the Appointments Committee help us with that. Um, so what I did want to make notice is that at the next meeting, we will have an executive session to begin that process. Um, and where it is an um, employment contract, it will, of course, it needs to be conducted in the executive session. And that's all I had for updates to the town manager. Great. I'd love to give a couple of updates. Um, in spite of a lot of time and attention with the budget, there's a lot of other moving parts right now. It seems extremely busy. Um, just to give you and the, and the public an update, uh, the Board of Assessment Review has reconvened on the 2012 tax appeals. Uh, they actually met on March 27th <coughs> and 29th and concluded the entirety of uh, their process. They now will meet back again on April 11th for deliberations. Um, they have all their information, and that meeting is here in these chambers at 6 p.m. Very hopeful that they'll be able to conclude deliberations that evening, uh, and we shall see how the matter proceeds from there. Uh, Avenue 2, a matter that's been a, a subject of a lot of conversation with this council. I believe Chairman Baybine provided some timeline out, uh, but essentially we're scheduled to have a workshop uh, to receive and discuss the information at uh, your meeting on May 3rd. And that would put us in a position uh, for the first meeting in June, potentially for action. Um, and we're still on track for that schedule. Uh, as Councillor Hayes mentioned, the police, uh, or should I say public safety building process is moving along at quite a brisk pace. Uh, they've completed their site selection process, which is one of the critical mandates given to them. And they've landed, uh, their preferred site is in fact next to Town Hall here on town owned property and they are anxious to do uh, some geotechnical work, to do with borings, to appreciate the ledge and all those sorts of details. For me, I'm uh, very interested in how that fits um, into the whole campus. And this council has been privy to some conversation about our long-term facility plan. And certainly, we all appreciate the value of having a, a campus and want to make sure we maximize its potential. And so, uh, with this police building committee really kind of moving along and landing at a preferred site, and there's also the senior recreation uh, facilities that we need to deliver this construction season. Um, I've contracted with Terry Dewan Associates to do some um, master planning, if you will, and it's just for this quadrant, if you will, from Town Hall over, including Memorial Park, really to make sure that uh, the sorts of things we're thinking about and, and planning on doing won't limit our future opportunities. And, and more than that, actually, uh, have the potential of kind of complementing each other. And I think there's some great opportunity, but we ought to have some forethought. The balance of that master plan, I think, is still important for the rest of the campus. And I have that in the budget. It will be a matter of discussion at the capital, uh, in the capital plan. Uh, but I have engaged uh, the, the landscape architects who will work closely with Angela Blanchett, our town engineer, and the design team uh, on board for the public safety building. Uh, in terms of staff vacancies, uh, it, this has been challenging uh, in the last couple of months, having uh, now three um, senior staff members gone. I really I, I can't um, underscore the importance of making those right decisions and in, in, in assembling the, the right team. One of those, uh, we are nearing the end, end zone. Uh, I did hire Todd Souza. He comes from the town of Wiscasset. Uh, interestingly enough, Councillor St. Clair, I believe it's her sister, works in the school department there and works very closely and gave a glowing recommendation. So we're very pleased to have Todd start in his new position on April 24th. Uh, Dan's position has been uh, advertised for a couple of weeks and will close later this month. As of today, we had eight applicants and actually I 
took the time to review them, some very highly qualified ones, some um, encouraged. Um, with respect to assessing, I'm not so encouraged. Uh, Chairman Babine sat through some interviews. Uh, there really was not a candidate that emerged from that process. And I'm not surprised. I've gone through this process a couple times, unfortunately, over the last three years, and the candidate pool is fairly shallow. Uh, surprise, surprise, not many people apparently are getting into the assessing field, it seems. Uh, and I think Scarborough, frankly, uh, by main standards, is a bit challenging. We have some diversity in our tax base. Uh, the commercial component is a challenge that not everyone can step up to. And quite honestly, I think our tax appeals has, have been a bit of a um, deterrent to certain applicants uh, just not wanting to step in the middle of that. So we're looking at strategies to get us to a point in the future where we can kind of go at it again. Um, my colleague, Matt Sturgis, former assessor here, uh, is going through a similar process and he's agreed to kind of compare notes with how he's faring through his recruitment. So this is a council appointment, so you'll be certainly involved uh, as we go forward. And lastly, um, I should have mentioned uh, in the context of the planning director vacancy, uh, I've appointed Karen Martin as interim director, planning director. Um, some of you may not know, Karen is actually a planner by uh, education and by trade. She, she found herself uh, in the economic development field fairly recently. Um, and so she's uh, just ideally qualified and suited to step into the roles. She and Dan and I have worked very closely on all the major projects, so it's almost seamless and very pleased to have Karen step up. Um, in that vein, Karen's also pairing or te teaming up with Jay Chase, our senior planner, to head up the comprehensive plan effort. Uh, Dan is, was anxious to kick this off, but we thought it best to start with a team and finish with the same team. And to that end, and Councilor Chiazzo um, alluded to it, uh, Karen sent out her first briefing. She intend to provide monthly briefings to the council, and we'll provide more if you like. Uh, but the kickoff will commence the week of May 22 with a joint meeting between the council and the Long Range Planning Committee. And then the following day, the consultants would like to do one-on-one -on -one interviews with all of you. They really want to spend time to understand to a person what your vision is. And so we'll be reaching out in that regard. But do pay attention to the briefing that Karen sent out late this afternoon. There's a lot of good information. It gives you a sense of um, how we're getting started and what we can expense, expect over the next 15 months or so. So with that, Mr. Chairman, complete. Thank you. Council Member comments, I'll start with Council Chiazza. Uh, so I, I did want to extend my appreciation to um, staff for putting the budget together. It's, 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 it's always tough to deliver, not the greatest news, but um, it's not the messenger. It's certainly the format is, is spot on. I think it's a great start. And uh, um, I know there's a lot of hard work put into <coughs> it and a lot more to come. So I, I did want to extend my appreciation for that. And, uh, I, and again, I, I just want to... Um, um, Send my best wishes to Dan. Um, I, I think it's a great opportunity for him, and you know, it's it is certainly a loss for us. But you never uh, you never wish anybody um, the you know you, you can respect that they need to make the right choice for them. And I think it's a great opportunity for him. And um, you know, I'm, I'm sure we haven't seen the last one. At least I hope we haven't. So, Councilor Hayes. No, I think I'm good tonight. Thanks. I'm ready. Thank <coughs> Councilor Foley. Um, what I I want to encourage all of my fellow counselors, because I don't know if you've been keeping track, but I am almost exactly on target with our goal of one-on-one -on -one meetings with individual counselors. So uh, I have one more person to track down, but I will have met with everybody at least. And, and for me, I will just say it's really helpful um, because there are going to be things that we disagree on, but I think when we can sit and talk one-on-one, -on -one, um, it helps me at least gain that perspective that's really needed to understand where someone's coming from. If you can understand where someone's coming from, that's half the battle. So I really appreciate that time. I know it's hard to carve it out, um, but it's really helpful, and, and I think it will help us as a group. So other than that, um, good. I, I have nothing there. Thank you. Council Donovan? Yeah, let me express appreciation to several community uh, businesses. Uh, 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 the Vietnamese restaurant Bo Hong opened about six, seven weeks ago down where the old Chicago Dogs is. Mm. Uh, I tried it uh, uh, about two weeks ago, liked it a lot, went back again this week. 
So uh, uh, I would encourage people to try it. Very, very enjoyable experience. Uh, uh, Karen Martin and I attended a Greater Portland Chamber of Commerce presentation uh, today. Uh, it was a presentation by David Howes, President of Martin's Point on healthcare advances and developments and uh, uh, best thinking at the present time. I think we're very lucky to have Martin's Point, it was mentioned earlier, uh, 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 their contribution to the community. Um, let's see, anything else? Uh, no, let me just finish by saying thank you, Dan Bay. Um, so I actually came, um, I left some notes at home, and I have to apologize because I had their specific names, but I wanted to congratulate two local businesses who will be recognized as um, small business of the year um, um, that are Scarborough based. The first one is Holy Donuts is being recognized, um, although they're new to our town. Um, I consider this their hometown now, so they are actually <laughs> getting, um, they're actually getting the top award of being the small, main small business of the year, so I wanted to congratulate them because they are now open. Um, the other one, if I remember correctly, I don't remember their names, but I believe it was called Flowfold, um, which is a um, entrepreneur, uh, young entrepreneur of the year award recipient. And then also wanted to mention, um, although it's, it's her bank, but uh, um, her being a Scarborough resident, I wanted to also congratulate um, Anne-Marie uh, Swenson who is Senior Vice President for Commercial Lending for People's Heritage, which was the uh, financial services um, um, entity of the year for the SBA. So uh, it's nice having a lot of Scarborough residents involved in our business communities across the board. So congratulate um, all of them. Wanted to mention uh, for the public really is um, um, if you see this, um, if you can schedule an uh, early time to watch this uh, before our regular meeting, we did have a workshop on um, local dispatch services uh, for our public safety. Um, it was a very good presentation by our police chiefs and I wanted to thank them for coming. Um, I did want to suggest, I didn't make the personal comment there because I didn't think it was appropriate. I hope that um, my fellow counselors as well as staff um, understand that while I think that the uh, request for more information around the financial impact is um, a nice to know, I don't need to know that information in order to support continuing those services. I made a commitment back in 2002 when we truly looked at it and it was cost beneficial to the town um, to go to the same location and it's just now more expensive and we're not the early ones in. So it's um, completely more expensive and I don't see the value for the community. So um, that would be nice to have but I don't need to con uh, need that to commit to keeping public safety dispatch here. Um, again, wanted to thank um, the entire staff. I know a lot of hours. Uh, you know, went into the budget preparation to our new assistant manager. Um, you know, we talk about we want to understand what the value of our prior, our, our past uh, decisions and the hirings have been. I hope that you look at this budget and you can see what Larissa has contributed already to this process. Um, it's seen throughout the budget. So thank you very much uh, to her as well as to the school board. You know, and I really meant what I said. I think the biggest change is that both boards are for the first time, at least in my tenure um, are on the same page going into this budget where it has been very div uh, divisive in the past. And so I think that speaks volumes to the process we've undertaken, but we do have a lot of work to do. Um, again, I am very optimistic. Um, the fact is we knew where we were going to be, um, so it's not um, a surprise. And um, while I want to remain toned and, and um, uh, careful in comments, I hope that um, I am going to be more specific and more direct around criticisms around uh, some of the metrics and comparisons that people keep trying to throw at us saying that we are um, not being prudent enough for our citizens I don't believe are accurate, uh, but I'll reserve those comparisons um, for a later presentation. And uh, last, I wanted to congratulate um, our interim planning director, Karen Martin. Um, if you did not know, she's also our CIDCO um, chief executive president Chief Executive and Director, I don't know what the title, um, but I really... Empress. Uh, Empress. 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 <laughs> She's now the Empress of Scarborough. I was, I was called on somebody's blog the King of Scarborough, so now you're the Empress of Scarborough. <laughs> so, um, no, I just wanted to say thank you for stepping in uh, for Dan um, and, uh, you know, and helping us out, but if you can also express our gratitude to the CEDCO board for allowing you to uh, do that job, sh uh, job share, I think it's really important. Um, and. Um, 
some of us hope you apply. I didn't say that out loud today. <laughs> but um, good luck and thank you very much for what you do. With that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. And that is unanimous, 6-0. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you all.